50 chance of getting it right. Okay. It's on the cloud right now. At least then it, it'll be backed up somewhere. All right, so we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. The April Landmarks Board meeting is called to order. Welcome to the April 3rd, 2024 board meeting. It is 6.01 p.m. And the first order of business tonight is Marcy will review the decorum for this virtual meeting setting. Thank you. Claire, would you go to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. All right, the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More about this vision and the project's community engagement process can be found online through the link on the page. Next slide. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business, no participant shall make threats or use other form of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And participants may raise their hand to speak during open comment and public comment periods during the hearings. Individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. And then the next slide is a good reminder of um, when the time comes for public comment, the host will ask uh, if anyone's interested in speaking to use the raise hand function. You can find that um, under the reactions menu at the bottom of the screen if you're on um, uh, a computer and then the raise hand function. There's a shortcut alt white if you're on a PC, option Y if you're on a Mac, or if you're calling in, it's a star nine. And then, um, Abby, one more announcement at the beginning of the meeting is that Lindsay Fwelling with the Certified Local Government Program at History Colorado is joining um, to observe our meeting um, this evening. Uh, it doesn't mean anything for the board members in terms of changing your behavior or um, <laughs> acting any differently, but know that uh, we welcome you, Lindsay. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Marcy. And I want to echo your welcome to Lindsay. I do want to acknowledge that we have a quorum this evening. A recording of this meeting will be available in the record archives and on YouTube within 28 days of the meeting. We'll do our roll call by quickly introducing ourselves. I'm Abby Daniels, chair of the board. Chelsea? Hello, Chelsea Castellano, Landmarks Board member. Hi, John Decker, Landmarks Board member. Ronnie Palucio, Landmarks Board member. Thank you. And even though we have a quorum, we do have one board member who is traveling and will not be joining us this evening. Uh, before we begin, we know that there are people here to participate that may have some strong emotions about particular projects. We want to hear from you and have found it is more productive if you are speaking to persuade us rather than berating us, staff, or the applicant. As with regular Landmarks Board meetings, you may only speak at the appropriate time during the public hearing. Request to speak outside of those times will be denied. As board chair, I will call for a roll call vote for any motions made this evening. The first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from the March 6, 2024 meeting. Do any board members have any changes or alterations to those meeting minutes? Seeing or hearing none, I move that we approve those minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, John. On a motion by myself, seconded by John, we'll do a roll call, roll call vote. Chelsea? Aye. John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote aye, so the um, minutes from last month's meeting are approved. So next, we will have public participation for any items not on tonight's agenda. 
And this is where you can raise your hand if you're joining us by Zoom or press star nine if you're calling into this. And I will give Lauren a few minutes to see if there's any members of the public wishing to speak to us at this point. Yeah, so um, first we have Gavin McMillan. Thank you. And then, Lauren, I'll ask you if anyone else has indicated an interest to speak. So, Gavin, please go ahead and speak. You'll have three minutes and state your full name when you begin. Okay. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay. We can. Great. One second, please. Um, my name is Gavin McMillan, and along with my partners, Brady Burke and Bo Burris, we own the building at 2260 Baseline Road. Uh, we were in front of you in January to discuss the demolition of the building at 2260 Baseline. And then in February, we met on site with Landmark staff and Abby and John from the Landmarks board. Um, we sat down at that meeting and rolled out the plans that we had been developing and working on for the last year and a half. And I think I had a really good discussion about the just the real challenges and difficulties associated with, with keeping the existing building and retrofitting it for housing, which is what we intend to do. Um, we appreciated hearing everyone's questions and, and hopefully we were able to illustrate just how it's it's just not possible to keep this building and build any significant amount of housing. Um, I'm here tonight, I guess, to tell you that our position just has not changed since since that meeting. It's it's just not possible to develop the amount of housing that the, the site is zoned for and, and, and calls for and that our community needs while simultaneously keeping the existing building on site. Um, it's been a little while since that on-site meeting, so just to quickly summarize the constraints and challenges. Uh, first is, is building height. We are unable to expand the existing building to the west due to the height restrictions and the way the height is measured in the city. And since expanding the building is not an option, we're uh, unable to retrofit the building with a significant amount of housing. And are actually forced to develop two separate buildings, um, which is a, a very significant change uh, and challenge. Um, there are significant accessibility and energy efficiency challenges with keeping the building. Um, providing AD, ADA accessibility between two separate buildings that do not share a parking structure would be very costly. And um, actually today, we just have not figured out a, a way to do that. Um, additionally, providing efficient mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems to two separate buildings is very inefficient and costly. Um, parking, keeping the existing building prevents us from building structured parking under the building due to the number of structural piers that I think we all saw during that, that site visit that are underground and underpinning this building. We'd have to work around. Um, this severely limits the amount of space available to meet parking requirements and in turn, it prevents us you know, from building housing. And lastly, uh, costs, and probably the biggest one, there are just significant construction costs associated with retrofitting the existing building to meet modern energy and building codes. Um, but the primary cost implication associated with keeping the building is the limits and the restrictions it places on the amount of housing that we can build. Um, to summarize, at this time, we determined that demolition of the building is the only economically viable path for us to move forward and build new housing on the site, and we're asking for uh, approval to remove the building from the site. Um, I want to thank you all for your time and service on the board, and we look forward to hearing your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gavin, for joining us this evening. And Lauren, I don't know if any additional members of the public have indicated they'd like to speak. Yes, we have uh, Lindsay Flewelling. Okay. And Lindsay, when you, uh, again, for the record, just state your full name and your three minutes will commence. Sure, it's uh, Lindsay Flewelling. I'm the Certified Local Government Coordinator from History Colorado, as Marcy said. Um, thanks for the welcome. I just wanted to um, jump on and say, um, you know, Boulder has is one of our oldest CLGs. You've been a CLG since 1985, um, and we currently have 67 um, across the state, and there are about 2,100 nationwide. Um, as you may know, one of the big benefits of the CLG pro program is our um, CLG grant program, which provides no match grants for um, preservation planning, um, design guidelines, survey, education outreach projects. And then also your um, 
locally landmark properties and contributing properties in local historic districts um, are able to access the um, state commercial and residential tax credits, uh, which are worth currently 25%. Um, and those are reviewed in Boulder um, with Claire and Marcy um, whenever those applications come up for residential and then uh, commercial properties are reviewed at History Colorado for those. Um, and then one of the responsibilities of the CLG program is an evaluation every four years. So that is um, basically I attend um, a meeting for the Landmarks Board and then I'll have a meeting with staff and then I go through all of your records at History Colorado from the past <clears throat> four years, like your annual reports, uh, meeting minutes, um, which I read throughout the year anyway, um, and anything else we might have on file. So um, that's what the evaluation entails, um, but it should be pretty straightforward since you guys meet regularly and you know carry out uh, your regular public hearings and things like that. Um, but yeah, just wanted to, to pop on and say hi and, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And Lauren, I'm gonna look to you again or, or speak to you again to see if anyone else has raised a hand. Well, it looks like if we have Lynn Spiegel. I don't know how anyone is so disinterested in the Landmarks Board as to like have no one speaking every, time after time. People should be, 50 people should be coming to these things. I do not get it. Um, something's going on. Something's really going on because 1015 should never have been demoed. Like Circle, like there's a big problem here. There's something going on behind the scenes. Money, I'm putting my money hands up because you can't see my image on the screen. Um, there's other things going on. 1015 probably had a good 1500 feet. I still don't know. Marcy, tell me how many square feet is it? But it was a good size for a family and it would have been fine left there. But you wanted to just hand over um, a few million bucks to the developer. Basically, that's what it is. They'll put a $10 million house on there, 5,000 square feet, and we could have had some affordable housing. What needs to happen with these kind of projects is that they need to go through planning board and EAB because this is a disgrace to the carbon footprint and the landfill and, and the HAB. It's a disgrace for affordable housing in Boulder because each time you put in a you know $10 million house, you spread the wealth equity and you get more people homeless and more people evicted and the, and then at the city council retreat, they're talking about, you know, just how to take care of the basics, the homelessness. Um, let's see, Western Resource Advocates. Um, so it, the point is, it's a bigger problem than just landmarks. And, and I think that that creates who's here and the new history that's going to be here. So these, these things can't just be dumped like this. The last house on Juniper, it's, it's a travesty. Um, it's unbelievable to me. Um, I, I, it, it's not a landmarks board. It's a planning board in disguise. Um, Western Resource Advocates, how is it that they got this permit that I understand from John, John if correct me if I'm wrong, to do, uh, to give them 16,000 more, more square feet if they're going residential. Because the, the, the other word for God in Boulder is housing. Well, housing is also the curse in that the more housing, the more services, the more services, the more need for housing, the more wealthy inequity, the more homelessness, et cetera. Um, there is a sister house ne or building just north of WRA. Do not demo that. Thank you, Lynn. And Lauren, any additional members of the public? Um, I think we, yep, so we just had a hand go down. Um, I think we're done for that part, portion of the public comment. 
Okay, thank you so much, Lauren. We will now officially close public participation for anything not on the agenda this evening, and we'll move on to a discussion of landmark alteration and demolition applications issued and pending. All right, so I'll go ahead and pull up my slides here. And here we go. All right, so we have one uh, stay of demolition pending um, currently, and that's the one that um, Gavin spoke to under open comment, which is 2260 uh, baseline, right on the uh, southwest corner of baseline and Broadway. And um, this mid century office building uh, came in for historic preservation review late last year. And then um, on January 10th, the Landmarks Board places stay of demolition uh, to explore alternatives. And on February 15th, we had a site visit with the applicants with which Gavin uh, kind of recapped the main takeaways uh, of that. And so um, this evening, April 3rd, um, a scheduling decision is in front of the board uh, this evening, not on the outcome of the application, but it um, the May 1st meeting is your last regularly scheduled meeting before the stay of demolition expires on June 1st. And so uh, your decision tonight is whether you wish to hold a hearing to either uh, approve the demolition or um, initiate the landmark designation process uh, for the property. So we have um, motion language uh, uh, prepared if the board wishes to make that motion. Um, but again, it's, it's more, does the board wish to hold a hearing to take action on this application before the stay expires? at a regularly scheduled meeting. Thank you, Marcy. John, I knew you weren't able to attend last month's meeting, but you were one of the board members at the site visit. So I think we'd all really value hearing your thoughts. Um, my thoughts, the problem with this particular situation is the fact that it's going to be very difficult to save the building and to do what the land is given to be able to do, which is to deliver a certain amount of housing based on density. And the one thing that was not discussed at that site meeting and that hasn't been discussed in any forum is the idea of preserving an L shape of the building that is the, I guess, landmark or monumental portion of it from baseline and Broadway and to incorporate it into the corner of the building that is developed. If Gavin is still there, I would love to hear him speak to that because it was never discussed. Partial preservation would be, I think, in the current economic environment of the city the best we could hope for um gavin is is gavin still there i think he mentioned looking forward to this conversation um it looks like he, he's, there, he's there yeah i i gavin could you speak to what i just discussed or threw out there um potentially uh, I, I don't know if my architect is here who can maybe help. I'm, and, and maybe you can rephrase, I'm not exactly sure what you're proposing. Um, what, what I'm proposing is, is that, and this is kind of a, I don't know, postmodern idea, is the notion of the wall that faces, that faces Broadway and the wall that faces baseline, the, the glass walls tend to be the most, I guess, visible and recognizable portion of this building. Um, and the idea would be to incorporate those walls only into the new building that is on that corner. 
Well, um, gosh, I hate to re respond just off the cuff on, I, you know, we did look at preserving the building and in different portions and like kind of a expanded version of what you're talking about. I can okay. tell you that it doesn't, yeah, it, it's what kind of what we're in for permit for. If, if, you know, we have, we had a designed a building that we were only able to get to a certain amount of size. We, we don't eliminate the problem of the height restrictions and expanding the building. It, it still leaves us with that problem. Um, it also, the problem with it is that that, that building is sitting in, in the setback. So, uh, on that, on the one side, so this is the area that we need to come under and park under. Um, I don't, I don't think we could do that. I mean, my initial reaction to your comment is that, um, I, I really feel like we've studied this extensively and I'm hesitant to even think that, that that's possible, which you're mentioning, if I'm understanding it correctly, because of the same restraints that I outlined in the public comment. Um, we need to kind of come come under the building, into the setback areas, and that building is sitting just in the wrong spot on the lot to do that. So saving any portion of it, I, I just don't know how we could do it. Okay, that's the answer. Um, thank you, Gavin, for that. John, was there anything else additionally you wanted to share? This is this is the type of building that we would want to preserve in the sense that it is a representative of a particular historical period in Boulder. It has a somewhat unique design character. There is a twin of it, not a perfect twin, but there is a twin of it elsewhere, uh, which may end up being threatened for the same reasons. And John, sorry to introduct, um, interject. I know that um, it gets a little fuzzy with uh, talking about the pending demolition case, but um, the board should try and not state a position about the outcome of the demolition application. The decision in front of you tonight, and you don't have to make a decision, um, is whether to hold a hearing to take action to either initiate the designation process or to approve the demolition. The board's um, opportunity tonight is to schedule that for the May 1st meeting to have that conversation. Um, an alternative, if you don't want to do that this evening is that the board could vote at the May meeting to hold a special hearing before June 1st. Um, so this isn't your last opportunity, but it's your last opportunity at a regularly scheduled meeting, but this really should just be a scheduling decision and not on the merits of the- Okay, All right. and so, Can I just ask, so our, our question is, do we wanna have this, we have to have a hearing you don't have to. No. You, can, you okay. can let the stay expire, and if the board doesn't take action before June first, the demolition would automatically approve. Okay. Or have a hearing on May first, or schedule another meeting between May first and June. 1st. Why would we do that? Just that would be a special it. meeting. But why would we do that? Just curious. Yeah, if you didn't feel like you um, knew whether or not you wanted to schedule a meeting tonight, you would still have enough time to make that decision on May 1st. It would just have to be a special meeting that we would have to convene mm -hmm. before June 1st. And okay. Chelsea, I agree that in a perfect world, we would avoid a second special meeting in May. I mean, I feel like we have the facts tonight to make a decision. Like there's there's no additional information that we're going to have in on May 1st that we don't have tonight in terms of if we want to schedule a hearing. So I feel like we should just decide if we either want to schedule a hearing for May 1st or or not schedule a hearing and, and let the stay of demolition expire. And Marcy, thank you for bringing us back to the crux of what's in front of us tonight. Um, I was one of the board members who was at the site visit and the applicants, I think, you know, really uh, went out of their way and gave us a lot of great information and walked us around the building. Um, I personally think, 
I mean, this is just such a cool building and the way the landscaping was integrated in it, including some built walls and everything. I mean, it's just such a cool, cool building. I think that when I supported a stay of demolition on this building, it was to explore creative alternatives. And I think what I found at the site visit for me, and I know Marcy and John and Claire were there as well, is that things I would have wanted the applicants to explore, they had in fact explored. And they had tried to come up with a way to do it and build another building you know, to the West and whatever, but, but it wasn't going to meet various um, city parameters is, is the best way I can phrase it. So I think what I wanted to see out of this day was actually already accomplished, you know, and um, I, I agree with, Stel with, with Chelsea that we should make a decision if we want to schedule an initiation hearing for May or not. And Abby, what do you think? Uh, it's I know you've been very involved. Um, what is your position on that? I I would love so badly for this building to be preserved. It does um, pay homage to the Hobie Wagner Green Shield building that is already a landmark. And what would be cool is sort of these sisters or cousin-like buildings. I think my position tonight is that everything that should have been discussed during the stay, I really think was discussed. And that because of what the, um, the applicants were trying to do with the existing building and were told they couldn't, I don't see a path forward to designating this building. And I, you know, I appreciate what John's trying to say. Could a portion of it be saved? And of course, what first comes to my mind is that that west facade of the um, Casey Middle School, where everything else was torn down, and then you just sort of, which, which in and of itself, sort of also gives a little bit of a, you know, it's not the best practice in the universe to to save just a portion of a historic building like Casey Middle School, but but I think that did turn out successful. I just, I, I, I don't want to support demolition of this building, but I also cannot support initiating landmark designation. And Marcy, um, can you speak to your thoughts on this? Hmm. Well, again, it's just a scheduling decision, so it's so it's um, hard to uh, steer away from stating a, a final outcome. Um, I I agree with what Abby um, has said, which there are kind of different types of um, applicants that come through this process. Some are more in the exploratory phase. What could we do with this property? I think the applicants for this particular project went as far as you can in terms of um, how do you incorporate this building into the redevelopment and they got very far into the building permit review before realizing that that it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't work out so i agree with abby that we have more information through this stay of demolition and, and at this point than we do with with typical ones um and so i i don't know like on the spot of whether i would advise the board to hold a hearing or not um, I think, I think I'm going to leave it up to you all. Uh, again, you're not making a decision on it tonight. That's, that's true. If you don't take action. Uh, you would have to hold a special meeting, um, to take action before the state expires. So I think that's why these decisions, these scheduling decisions can feel so weighted. Um, but again, it's really, do you want to have a hearing to discuss this in the open forum on May 1st or not? Well, Marcy brings up a good po point that also makes it a public hearing. I would, um, I would prefer based on what the applicant has brought forward um, and the robust nature of the attempts that they have made to incorporate this building into the future use of it, which is so important that it's housing. 
Um, and what I've heard from those who have been to the site visits, like, I think that we know, or I, I think that letting the stay of demolition expire is the approach that would, um, that would best meet, like, that would best address what we've seen up until this point. And I don't think we're going to learn anything new that's going to change that. And um, yeah, I just, I don't think we need to go through that whole process um, based on the information we have now. So I would vote to just let the stay of demolition expire. I'll, I'll jump in and complete what I was saying at the beginning. I concur with that. I think we should take no action. Okay, I, I also would support that. I trust in um, John and Abby's and Marcy's description and what you have explored and experienced on site. And, you know, I would agree to that as well, John. I I think I would, I can also, I mean, it, you know, I lament that this, this wonderful mid-century jewel um, is, you know, uh will not probably be saved but i i i just um you know i lament that but i do think that um i would support taking no action this evening okay and so marcy do you i mean taking no action, there's no vote we take, so. Yes, so um, we would then move on because we don't have any other um, pending stays of demolition. We would then move on to the first public hearing item. Okay, the first public hearing is 5A. It's a public hearing in consideration of an application to demolish a house constructed in 1910 at 613 Walnut Street, a non-landmarked building over 50 years old, pursuant to section 9-1123 of the Boulder Revised Code. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? We can. Excellent, okay, you can't see me. All right, thank you, Abby. Um, this is a, a quasi-judicial hearing, so I will go over the procedures. Um, all speaking will be sworn in and uh, board members will note any ex parte contacts. I'm gonna be giving the staff presentation tonight. Um, after that, the board may ask questions and the applicant will have 10 minutes to present to the board. The board may ask questions of the applicant. Um, we'll then open the public hearing and um, after all members of the public have made comments, the applicant may respond to anything that was said. We'll then ask everyone to mute their computers and the board will deliberate. A motion requires an affirmative vote of at least three board members to pass and motions must state findings, conclusions and recommendation. A record of this hearing is available in a couple of days as a video recording and the official record will be um, added to the records archive within 28 days, usually sooner. Uh, so the board has requested that if we reviewed this previously at the Landmarks Design Review Committee, we note um, who were members of the committee and it was reviewed on February 21st by Chelsea Abbey and uh, Marcy as a staff member. So uh, back to you, Abby, for ex parte contacts. Thank you so much, Claire. I have no ex parte contacts, uh, Chelsea. None. John. None. Ronnie. None. Okay, Claire, back to you. Great, thank you. So the criteria for review is outlined in the Boulder Revised Code under 9-11-23. Um, this is a demolition application, so the purpose of reviewing uh, this application is to prevent the loss of buildings that have historic or architectural significance uh, by providing some time to consider alternatives to demolition. Um, and there has been um, some confusion 
about why this application doesn't include a proposal for new construction. So I wanted to, um, to be clear of the criteria for review under section 9.11.23. And that's the, um, the eligibility of the building for designation as an individual landmark. So if it has historic or architectural significance, and their relationship of the building to the character of the neighborhood um, as an established and definable area. So that's the, um, the uh, what we call the environmental significance. So um, the board may also con consider the reasonable condition of the building and the projected cost of restoration or repair, although not deterioration caused by unreasonable neglect. And the options for the board tonight are to approve the full demolition or to place a 180 day stay of demolition to find alternatives. Uh, so the application process so far, uh, we received the application in February. Uh, due to the age of the building, it was reviewed by the Landmarks Design Review Committee first, um, which referred the application to the Landmarks Board for review in a public hearing, finding there was probable cause to believe that the building may be eligible for a designation as an individual landmark. So, uh, let me find my pointer. Okay, the um, the property is located north of Canyon Boulevard um, between Sixth, which is here, and Seventh Streets. Uh, the the house faces south towards uh, Canyon Point Park, which is which is this park right here. Um, this historically was Walnut Street. This is Walnut Street here, and it used to go through uh, before Canyon Boulevard um, was extended to to complete this loop. Uh, originally, Walnut went through and continued along this line here. Um, the adjacent properties include multi-family buildings at uh, 601 Canyon Boulevard uh, right here and 624 Pearl Street <laughs> right here. Notice the address changes. This one is Canyon Boulevard. This one's Pearl Street, just to confuse you, but this one is actually still 613 Walnut Street. So there's an alley along the back of the property. Um, the property is also within the boundaries of um, an identified potential historic district. Um, shown in green here, this is the property here. The, this green box is the potential historic district. Um, it is um, also surrounded by existing historic districts, including Mapleton Hill Historic District, the Downtown Historic District, the West Pearl Historic District. Um, and there um, also are some um, individual landmark buildings that are, that are here in orange. There are actually six within that proposed historic district there. So this is a one-story uh, vernacular frame house. It has um, an L-shaped gable form with uh, overhanging eaves, uh, wood shingles, and and front porch, which you can see right here. Uh, this is the south elevation, so originally facing Walnut Street, but currently facing the park. Um, it includes a project projecting uh, front gable right here, um, the hipped roof porch, which spans the front. There are actually two entry doors within the porch, um, which are not original. Um, and uh, a low balustrade on the, the porch with some turned porch supports. There's also wooden filigree ornamentation in each of the, the gable ends that you can see here. Um, and uh, decorative uh, wood trim around many of the wood double hung windows. Um, and the building is clad in painted wood shingles. The house itself uh, retains a moderate degree of architectural integrity since its construction in the 1890s. Um, this, these are, this is the footprint. Um, it's kind of faint, but you can just about see it. This is from the 1934 to 1949 tax assessor card, and it has not changed from then until now. Um, the, uh, the, the, one story 
gable roof form and the front porch and door and window openings are largely intact. Um, however, there have been incremental alterations that impact the integrity. The original arched window you can just about see uh, behind the tree um, in the facade was, was removed um, sometime after 1988 and replaced with this rectangular double hung window. The, um, the original uh, narrow lap siding has been replaced with the shingle. Um, the decorative wood trim uh, that you see on the exterior was actually removed from the interior and, and put on the exterior at some point. And the, uh, the filigree ornamentation in the gable ends was added after 1988. Um, and also the, actually the balustrades at the, the front porch were also a later addition. Um, this is uh, an image from around 1960 uh, before, uh, this is Canyon Boulevard right here, uh, before it was uh, paved and extended. Um, so this is, is Walnut Street back here. Um, not great pictures, we apologize, but uh, you kind of get the idea of, of how much this has changed. You can see the, the multi-story. Uh, um, buildings on either side and the uh, the road. Um, the building's ability to convey its association with um, its original use as a working class residential building um, has been diminished by the construction of, of all of these aspects, the multifamily buildings on the adjacent property. Um, and although it's in its lo original location, the setting of the house on the property has substantially changed um, both with the adjacent construction and also that it that it now faces this park rather than the historic context of uh, Walnut Street and, and the addition of Canyon Boulevard, uh, which is a state highway, has also impacted its historic context. So as I mentioned, the criteria for review are outlined in 91123F of the Boulder Revised Code. Uh, which includes the eligibility of the building for designation as an individual landmark outlined in 9111 and 9112. Uh, the relationship of the building to the character of the neighborhood also. Um, we use significance criteria that was adopted by the board in 1975 to evaluate in a consistent manner. Um, to be eligible, the property only needs to meet one of these adopted criteria. Uh, but commonly accepted practice is that a building should also retain the physical features that allow it to convey that significance. So this is the historic significance that we found. Um, it is likely, although we couldn't confirm it, that Jonas Anderson Jr., uh, who is a Swedish immigrant, and his son Fred Anderson uh, built the house. Um, this is uh, Jonas and uh, younger Fred right here. Um, Based on ownership records and area photographs, um, we think the house was likely built sometime between 1885 and 1889. Uh, the first residents were recorded in 1900 and they were uh, Sophia and Andrew Bernstein, who were also Swedish immigrants um, and they lived at the property for two decades. Uh, Rosina and William Crow lived in the house for three decades. Um, it was uh, back then in the town of West Boulder, which was incorporated in 1874 by um, some landowners who lived in the neighborhood, including um, Jonas Anderson and his father, Jonas Anderson Sr. Um, so this was an area of small farms, orchards and residences that was located along the main wagon road, which led towards Boulder Canyon. Um, and as those uh, wagons were replaced with trains and then cars, the area redeveloped with industrial and commercial interests. Um, the building was recognized in 1988 in, the, um, in a historic building inventory, um, which said at the time the building retained a high degree of integrity, including its original porch and semicircular arched window, and that it was representative of the vernacular frame houses being constructed by the working class of Boulder in the 1890s. 
So most, most of the um, architectural significance of the building has been lost. It, um, it retains the, the vernacular wood frame and the gable elf form, um, but any skilled or artistic carpentry that might have been added originally, uh, including the curved facade window and trim and porch detail has been removed. And the decorative filigree and uh, current window and door trim was added to the exterior of the house after 1988. The environmental significance is, um, is diminished through the construction of large multifamily buildings on adjacent properties, um, and also through the loss of the historic context. Um, it is located in an identified potential historic district. However, um, we think it's unlikely that the house would still provide historic and environmental importance or significance as a representative example of the character of this area of Boulder. So the house, uh, as I mentioned, originally faced Walnut Street, which would have been about here um, until 1958 Canyon Boulevard, um, which was also called Water Street, ended at 10th Street. Um, and then Walnut Street terminated at uh, 3rd Street, so uh, further west. Um, and Pearl Street continued westward to become uh, Boulder Canyon Highway. So that was that wagon route um, and during the 1960s, the streets were realigned to um, so that Canyon Boulevard became the main west-east thoroughfare. Um, this realignment and the construction of, of these um, large multifamily buildings on adjacent properties, um, plus the, the replacing of, of Walnut Street with uh, Canyon Point Park, has resulted in the loss of the character of this neighborhood. So the, uh, the applicant didn't submit information related to the condition of the building or the cost of restoration or repair, but I believe um, they have included some information in their presentation. So staff's findings are that a stay of demolition for the property at 613 Walnut Street is not appropriate based on the criteria set forth in section 911.23F of the Boulder Revised Code. Um, while the building meets um, criteria outlined in the significance cr criteria for individual landmarks, it doesn't retain the physical features that allow it to convey that significance, including the relationship to the character of the neighborhood. Staff's recommendation is that the Landmarks Board approve the demolition application for the building at 613 Walnut Street, finding that the building does not have significance under the criteria set forth in 911.23F. Um, if the, uh, the board chose to issue the demolition approval, staff would require that prior to any demolition, um, the following um, measured drawings of the exterior elevations, a site plan and high quality digital photographs of the interior and exterior of the building would be um, recorded with the, the Carnegie Library for um, in their archive. So that's the end of the staff presentation. Um, this is a reminder of the next steps in the process. The applicant has up to 10 minutes to present to the board, uh, followed by public participation, um, an opportunity for the applicant to respond to anything that's said, and then board deliberation. And uh, the, um, the question today for the board is if the building has historic significance. Um, and if yes, the board will place a stay of demolition on the application to provide time to consider alternatives. And if no, the board will approve the demolition request. So um, are there any questions from the board before we continue with the applicant's presentation? John? Yeah, I have one question, Claire. Can um, is this in the floodplain? I know that the path on Point Park actually is raised to create a kind of a flood barrier from the canyon side to Walnut, um, but the possibility of secondary flood coming down Walnut is probably unchanged. So um, how? I actually don't know if the applicant can't answer that, then I can look that up while the um, applicant gives their presentation, if that's okay. Okay, that, I think that would be an important piece of information. 
Ronnie, Thanks. Chelsea, any questions for Claire? None for me. I don't have any as either. And thank you guys. And Claire, I have a quick question because I, I had to resist trying to do any research on my own. This is the Jonas Anderson that was um, like the Anderson Ditch is named for um, south of Boulder Creek, correct? That I also don't know. Um, there are a lot of Andersons in Boulder, so uh, yeah. that would also be something I'd have to research. Uh, Jonas Anderson Sr., who was the father of Jonas Anderson Jr. and Fred Anderson, was one of the founders of West uh of West Boulder, but I'm not sure if the ditches are named. I'm pretty sure just um, that, that it's the same Jonas Anderson that the ditch is named after and who was real instrumental in, in early Boulder. So thank you. Um, if there's no more questions for Claire, we'll move on to the applicant's presentation. I will need to swear whoever's speaking in um, and you will have 10 minutes. Great. So I see um, the owners, uh, Joan and Ernest Sofer here. So I'm going to send a invitation to join as a panelist. And here we go. So you'll see a pop up on your screen. And then um, from Coburn Partners, just a reminder to um, change your name, your commonly known name there. And you should see that pop up here in a few minutes. And then uh, Lauren will get the timer going. The applicant will have uh, 10 minutes to present. Right, even she, if there's multiple speakers, that'd be great. And everyone uh, who speaks will need to raise their hand and swear to tell the board the full truth. Lauren, would you mind uh, pausing the, the timer for a minute? I need to, um, I've lost my Zoom control, so I need to reshare. You bear with me a second, I apologize. There we go. And I see Ernest and um, Coburn have joined as panelists, uh, and Joan will be joining shortly. And I don't know who's going to kick it off for, on the applicant team. Are you ready for us? We. If Claire, you have what you need to do the, the slides. Yeah, do you see them? Is that the, yes. your first yes. slide, Pete? Yes. Okay, just and, let me and, know when you need me to proceed. Okay. Thank you. Um, and do raise your hand to swear to tell us the whole truth and then your full name and proceed. Okay, my name is Peter Weber and I swear to tell the whole truth. And my name is Ernest Sofer, Thank you, Karen. and I swear to tell her whole Thank truth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so we can dive in here. I think we maybe want to start with um, with Ernie. Ernie and his wife Joan are the owners of the property, and they've been there for many years. Um, so, Ernie, maybe just you could help tell everybody, you know, kind of why we're all here today. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, so. so, so, so. Be before I start that, yeah. uh, sorry, could you pause the timer, Lauren? Um, and I, we're just getting a big echo with Ernie's um, comments and Joan, it might be with your microphone as well. And Joan, one thing you can try is lowering your speaker because sometimes the speaker gives feedback to the microphone and that could be what's happening. Yeah. And Joan, I'm sorry, I muted your computer. So if you wouldn't mind unmuting it, we'll pause the timer and, and give you all time to get the audio dialed in. And now click on that, click on that. Okay. Um... We can hear you well right now. Okay. Um, Start video. So, um, 
in terms of the question about the floodplain that that you had john um one of our neighbors um who uh was a cu professor and um an expert on uh floods uh gilbert white um he actually lived at 624 um when i bought the property and he definitely said that uh, 613 Walnut was in the floodplain, and he highly recommended flood insurance. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, I bought the building in the 80s and uh, did... Um, extensive renovation uh, primarily inside but also outside and um, I bought the building um, to use as a business office and as an investment and, and I, I apologize this is Chris Reynolds at the city attorney's office Mr. Soper would you mind um, swearing yourself in and just stating your name for the record oh I thought I did that. Uh, Ernest Soper, um, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, my wonderful wife, Joan, and I um, have uh, served the community for many years uh, as psychologists uh, working out of this building. We're now retired and um would like to be able to obtain um you know the full and, and fair value uh of uh this investment and to do that apparently um potential buyers would need to have the option of being able to demo. So um, I can answer, uh, John and I can answer questions later, but Pete, do you want to start your presentation? Sure, I can take it from here. Thanks, and, Ernie. And Pete, you already swore your, uh, to tell the truth, correct? I did, I can do it again. No, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> okay, um, Claire, if you want to go to the next slide. So the first thing we did um, when we realized we needed to come talk to the larger board was to review the criteria. And I think um, the important thing that I wanted to mention is, is these words, important, significant, and special. Um, and I think in our opinion, um, this building, while um, it has been kept up fairly well, doesn't really quite rise to the... Uh, the level of those words. Um, things to consider are the relationship to the neighborhood character. Claire touched on that, along with the condition of, of the property and the cost of repair. And I'm gonna go into each one of those a little bit. If you go forward, Claire. So the, the 1922 Sanborn map is on the left. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Sanborn maps. And that you know indicates um, the character of the neighborhood as it once was when it was sort of originally built in its first few decades. And you can see there's a series of small buildings with large yards, um, single family, uh, single family homes, a couple of small triplexes. These buildings were largely single story, um, in some cases two story. Uh, and you can see in the two photographs there, 613, the house in question, along with its neighbor, which is now a large condominium building to our east. You can just see some hints of it in that greeny picture. And the 601 Walnut was our former neighbor or the building that was where our neighbor is at 601, uh, 601 Walnut, which was torn down sometime, I think 2011, 2012, or something like that. But you can see just from the Sanborn map that the character of this neighborhood was very different um, in 1922 and up until um, the much more recent decades. If you go forward, Claire. This is what we have today. This is from Google Earth, um, and you can see them just the sheer um, footprint of the buildings that live around us. 
is significantly different um, than when it was originally built and as it evolved. Uh, the green is the is our site here, and you can see the size of some of the buildings, some of them from the PUD era of the 80s, um, some of the larger ones. Keep going. And this is what it looks like today, or a couple days ago. Um, 601 Walnut, you can see there um, in the picture on the left is our immediate neighbor. It is now a two and three story uh, townhome building. And then the large condominium building at 624 Pearl Street is the brick building. So both the kind of a front and a rear view of that. And I think these do a nice job of showing um, the building in that context um, and how diminutive it is in, in comparison to our neighbors. Next. And then see, these are some of the surrounding buildings. Again, a large condominium building that's just a couple doors away. Um, on the left, the um, building across the alley is the building on the right. Keep going. And then again, in view of this property, this kind of from the alley, you can barely see a hint of, of 613 um, amongst the two larger buildings. Next. And then here it is again from the rear. And then one more about the surrounding. I guess there's two more. This is the shot from across Canyon. And then the next one is a, an aerial view, which I think really does a nice job of showing um, how the context that this building was built in has been almost entirely erased. And now um, it's a bit of a, um, an anomaly um, with regard to its neighbors and the rest of the neighborhood. So we think the neighborhood significantly changed and this, this small, um, small building has really lost its, its original context um, by virtue of what's happened around it. And then next, so Claire pointed out some of the alterations and I'll just go, I won't, won't belabor this, but um, since you've already talked about it, but I do, did want to note that the gable on the rear here was added. I think it sounds like sometime in the thirties, um, the gable in the back was added. All of the windows have been replaced. The siding is not the original siding. Um, the original siding was a clapboard siding and now you can see it's a shingle siding. Not sure when that was done. Um, all the windows have been replaced, including the arch windows that Claire mentioned. Um, the window trim has been replaced. Um, the porch roof has been altered. Um, a door has been added, an added opening on the front there. You can see there's two of those wood doors. Um, all the doors have been replaced. Um, and then the added porch rail and all the scroll work has also been added. And then next. Um, so what we need, to, what needs to happen to this building if it is to remain is a lot. Um, it is not in really in moving condition. Um, there are many things that really need to be addressed. Um, the porch is settling. Uh, the roof, if you look closely at the upper image there, um, it needs to be entirely replaced. The shingles, there's many shingles missing. They're thin. It needs to be entirely replaced. The um, plumbing is in pretty rough shape. Um, I was down in the crawl space, as you'll see in a minute. Um, it really, needs a full gut and remodel for somebody to really in, re-inhabit this. The kitchen um, has been removed. There's no kitchen currently in the building. Um, the siding it needs to be repaired and or replaced in several places. Um, one of the egregious spots is at the crawl space access in the, the lower image. Um, and then the ceiling and the interior has unfortunately been lowered um, about 18 inches. Um, and so we have a very low ceiling what could otherwise be a fairly decent ceiling height. Um, so I think we would, you would want to change that. And by the time you do all of that, and you look at the next pictures, um, which is the existing foundation in the crawl space, um, it's hard to justify doing all that work and leaving this building on the existing foundation. It's a rubble foundation um, that has been messed with um, in many locations. You can see the amount of rock and brick that's actually on the ground and not where it's supposed to be. Um, as part of the wall. Some of it is grouted, or, uh, mortar, as you can see, uh, particularly in the image on the left, but some is not. Um, uh, it's in pretty rough shape down there. Um, and then you can also get a sense of what's going on with the plumbing. Um, it's a mess. So we did not you know, do a firm cost estimate of what it would take to rehabilitate this building, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Um, this is a, you know, 1,000 square foot building. Um, that's a lot of money for 1,000 square feet. Uh, so, again, if we go back to that criteria, um, and, significant. And Pete, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the 10 minutes has expired. But because of a couple okay. of technical glitches, we'll give you another few uh, moments to wrap up. I'm, I'm basically done. I just wanted to reiterate those three words, important, significant, and special. Um, and bring that to your attention. We think the neighborhood has changed significantly. The building has been changed. And it's going to be really expensive to try to put this thing back together as it once was. That's thank, it. Thank you so much. And we will see if any board members has questions for you or the owners right now. And then after public comment, um, you will have an opportunity to address the board for an additional three minutes. So. Do any of my colleagues have questions for Pete or Ernie and Joan? Abby, I, if I could, I could. Um, I did take a look at the flood information um, while we were offline there. Um, uh, here and here you are. Yeah, it's in the 500-year flood zone. I think the improvements to that were done with the park there um, took it out of the 100 year, but it is in the 500 year. And you can see just just touching 601 is the is the 100 year. Hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. John, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. OK, before we move on to public comment, any questions from the board at this point? None for me. Thank you. And then uh, this is the time for any members of the public, if you would like to speak to this item, to raise your hand on the Zoom call or press star nine if you want to speak over a phone. And Lauren, I'll give you a, a moment or so to see if um, anybody from the public would like to address this. And Abby, I'm going to take over the MC uh, oh, part okay. of the Laura can run the, the timer in the background. So again, yes, this is your chance if you'd like to speak to 613 Walnut, use the raise hand function found at the bottom of your screen. And Abby, we have um, two people so far who wish to speak. Um, I believe it is uh, Tim with 624 Pearl Residents Association, followed by Dylan Williams. Thank you. And both Tim and Dylan, when it's your um time to speak, you will need to raise your hand and swear to tell the board the full truth, and then your three minutes will commence. So, Tim, go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi. Can you hear us? I yes. will need you to raise your hand and swear to tell the board the full truth, state your full name for the recording, and then your three minutes will commence. I swear to tell the full truth. My name is Tim Mahoney. I'm the... Uh, president of the 624 Pearl Residents Association. Uh, this is the building that's referred to uh, in the description uh, just east of 613 Walnut. And uh, <clears throat> we're here tonight to bring a little more context to the, the building and its relationship to the neighborhood. Um, in 1982, uh, Gilbert White, Larry Senich, Kenneth Boulding and others uh, purchased three all these properties, including 613 Walnut, um, with the idea of building uh, a development uh, where it is now. And uh, the the building of it and the completion of it was taken over by West Pearl Development. Um, as part of West Pearl Development's um, promise to the 624 uh, residences, an easement was given uh, on the same day that we took possession of the building for the property on which 613 Walnut is currently sitting. So we still have uh, an easement on the entire piece of property, not including the building site. Um, that was part of the development agreement. So three years after this, uh, the building was sold, the building um, with the easement still in place, as it is today. Uh, 624 residences have maintained that property, uh, sprinklers, uh, mowing, 
uh, tree trimming, things like that for the last, well, 30, 38 years. Um, uh, something about the context of, there are several other properties in the block that this house and 624 are in that are historic uh, buildings and we, remove, we feel removing more of them wouldn't necessarily be in the interest of the neighborhood, uh, particularly Arnett Fallen House. And there's a historic uh, blacksmith shop just about 50 feet from the back of this property. It's also his, a historic. Um, but we also would feel like we needed to point out that the, the house is sitting directly on the property line at one point um, to the property to the west. So um, I would assume there would be some kind of easement issue uh, or um, setback issue that would have to be dealt with. Uh, we also have no plans for um, what the future development is. And so we would ask that the consideration of the historic uh, nature of this property to 624 and to the neighborhood be taken into consideration. Thank you, Tim, and your time did just expire, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, Dylan Williams, I believe is next. And Dylan, um, if you would raise your hand and swear to tell the board the full tr truth, your three minutes will begin. Where to tell the full truth. My name is Dylan Williams, and I was wondering if you could show the map that we sent in our comment. Um, I would just like to, can somebody put that up on the screen, please? Yeah, Lauren, would you um, would you mind pausing the timer for a second while I while I find that and and get it up? It's going to take me a couple of minutes. Uh, I could share my screen if you prefer. I think um, it'll be easiest if, if Claire pulls it up. And if um, in the meantime, if anyone else is uh, planning to speak, you could use this time to find the raise hand function and um, and uh, be in the line. And Claire, I have it available if uh, if that's easier. I am right there. Hang on a second. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so, so this is a map of the neighborhood. I think that one of the things that uh, I noticed in the previous presentation was that they really focused on this house being sandwiched between two new developments. Um, I, I think that, that that really does miss all of the other historic buildings around the neighborhood. Um, just previously, there is mention of the blacksmith shop, just um, sort of kitty corner. Um, that's uh, landmarked and a really unique building. The Arnett Fullen House landmarked and on the National Historic Register. Uh, just on the other side, um, the um, two houses from the 1980s, which are really in very, very good shape, uh, just down on 7th Street. There is the um, building right across from there, uh, built in 1900, but even more uh, interesting is the old stage house uh, that was constructed in the 1890s, and that's really a marvelous house there. And then the Racket Meat Market, um, uh, also landmark from 1901. So uh, I think that there really is a, a lot of historic buildings around here. And I think it's really too bad that uh, one would um, try to use sort of as a justification for demolishing a house that's actually, uh, I think looks would be very recognizable to people uh, who, who have lived there in the past. Um, 
to 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 use the existing you know the new building to to justify demolishing that there's also mention of the state of the house um i think that um you know, people sometimes call that uh, demolition by neglect. I'm not sure that that's exactly what happened here, but um, it's it's up to the owners to deal with that. That's not supposed to be a justification for um, for um, demolishing something. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that you know Walnut Street did used to extend through this uh, Canyon Point Park, and um, in some ways, uh, it, it, it hasn't really diminished that house in particular. There's a very nice path that goes right in front of it where people can walk by and look at it. You can also walk through be, um, uh, behind the house and see it from the alley in quite a nice way. And um, yeah, we'd love it if, if the other, if all of the buildings could have been preserved in, in this neighborhood. But as you can see, quite a number of them have been preserved. So. Um, we would really like to see this house uh, maintained, and um, and uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, Marcy, are there additional members of the public? Yes, we have one uh, one more person um, from the public, Lynn Siegel, up next, and then if anyone else is interested in speaking, um, go ahead and use that raise hand function. Thank you. And Lynn, um, I will need you to raise your hand and sort of tell the board the full truth and your three minutes will start. I'm sorry, give me just a second. Um, can you restart the timer if you've not started it already? Here we go. I swear to tell the truth the best that I know it, not the truth, the best I know. The fact that this is an environmental character issue, it's not that. It's a systematic takings of this property. And a lot of the arguments I agree with Dylan that, oh, the rest of the neighborhood has grown, you know. Ha have you ever read the book? My, my mom read me this book when I was three and four years old, The Little House by Virginia Lee Burton. You know, I'm not in this field. My son's an architect. I'm an ultrasound technologist, but you know, I embody historic preservation and it matters to me. And all I see in Boulder is more and more takings like this. Now I appreciate Ernest and Joan, but I don't think that they can bet on making the big buck from multi-story apartment buildings on their property that I value, that many people that drive by on Canyon can see, that is beautiful from the frontage and, and the back and the, and the other historic properties around it. You know, I so wish that I could be here to convince you of something, you know, I'm not a big convincer. I just think people should do their job. And I really think the Landmarks Board is just a fraction of what it should be. Like I said, it's really the planning board in disguise. And I think a lot of people in the historic community agree with me, but I'm just speaking for myself. You know, the little house precedent took it over. And yeah, it was the last one down. And that's the reason to leave it. If it was the last one down, as Dylan showed, it was not. It is not. Diminutive, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. These issues of how it's been changed, how you have to fix it up is deferred maintenance. I know that. I've got a place with a lot of deferred maintenance. Yeah, I know it's costly, but I'm trying to preserve my thing here. You know, I can't even see my grandkids because they're in another state. I, I'm anchored to my house, but it matters to me. 
Lynn, I'm sorry, but your time has expired. And Marcy, just checking to see if anyone else has expressed an interest in speaking to this item. I'm not seeing any other hand uh, raised at this point. So um, this is a final call if you'd like to speak to um, this application for 613 Walmart, please. Uh, and it, it looks like, Tim, you may have raised your hand again, though it's a policy of, of just one public comment uh, per evening. For per agenda item, we have another speaker. Uh, is that okay on the same line, or do we need to call in again? Oh, oh no, sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize there were multiple people there. Um, so you can go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, swear to tell the truth. Okay, this is Mark McMillan, and I swear to tell the entire truth. Uh, also a resident of six twenty four Pearl, just wanted to ask. We we put some. Uh, Put some slides together as well for the uh, for the board to review. And uh, as as Tim alluded to, we have a a perpetual easement on all of the non-developed portion of six thirteen. And I was hoping, as you did for Dylan, you'd be able to pull up the map that shows that easement for the board members to look take a look at, please. Yeah, you can do that. Lauren, would you please pause the um, the timer for a second while I put those together? I want to see our presentation. Here we go. I got it. I got it. Here we go. Okay. All right. Yes. Can you see this? Okay. Good. Yes, absolutely. If you could move to the, the page, I think it's a third page that will show the, the map with the easement, because I think that helps establish the context that we're discussing here. So you can see the, the uh, footprint of the building is excluded from the easement, as is the parking lot for, for parking spaces. It was really intended, as Tim mentioned, the professors that put this uh, plan together owned both parcels and their vision, which was agreed to by the city at that time, was to provide open space uh, and, and basically a landscape, perpetual non-exclusive landscape and access easement is what our, our easement says. Full and free pedestrian access over and across the easement, no permanent structures or improvements shall be placed on said easement said easement being over, under, across the following described property, which basically gives us that. So we wanted to make sure that everybody understood the context of the footprint of the building as it uh, as it exists. And basically the, 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 the building uh, as, as it might be in the future. And you can see the, the, the setback issue that might be encountered or would be an is issue, I believe for the, type of zoning, it would be a 10, 10 foot easement there on the side. So the footprint of any future building would, would be uh, quite diminished. And it just seems a building uh, that uh, is, you know, 125 plus years old, uh, you know, Colorado being maybe 25 years along in the process uh, at the stage, uh, taking it away, uh, you can't you can't go backwards and without understanding what the future part of this picture really might be it seems uh kind of unwise to uh allow it to turn into a hole in the ground uh because it may be a challenge to fill that hole properly so we just wanted to provide the i, I guess the context there and uh and and ask that rather than just uh I, i'd say blanketly approving this that you do a little more investigation uh, into the 
into the property in the easement because we felt that the the memo, the 24 page memo that staff put together, while included lots of great detail on previous uh, residents, did not really give good context to the to the easement that's in place and how that would have bearing on any future development that might go there. Thanks very much for your time and we appreciate your efforts. Thank you, Mark. And I don't know, Tim, was there anyone else from your HOA that was planning to speak that we might not see? Uh, no, we, we uh, no, that was, that was, that was it. Okay. I, points. I, I would we, say as, we as feel well heard. Thank I, you. I would say as long as the board has taken a look at the package we sent, we'd, we'd feel that you could make a fair decision. Okay, thank you so much. Marcy, before we close public participation, I'm going to give you another chance to see if anyone else has expressed an interest. Right, I am not seeing anyone else uh, with their uh, hand raised for this item. Okay, we will officially close public participation for item 5A. And Pete and Ernie, this is the additional three minutes that you have to rebut or respond to anything said during public participation. Go ahead, Pete. I think that I just want to address the, the question of the easement. Um, my understanding is that uh, what you have before you uh, should be judged on its merits of the, the building itself and whether or not it, it could be eligible and that the, the easement should have nothing to do with that decision is entirely um, a separate subject, which um, which we'll have to deal with at some point. So um, I don't know if the city attorney's office wants to weigh in on that, but um, it's my understanding that um, that has no bearing on this discussion. And Ernie, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, not really, I'm glad to answer any questions. Okay, thank, thank you gentlemen. Thank you. So now we will turn it back to board deliberation. I believe we thought we could deliberate for about 25 minutes or so as needed for the question in front of us tonight. I don't know what my colleagues' questions they may have um, at this point, or if someone is willing to jump in and start off the discussion. I can start. Um, I'll just be short and sweet. And um, I just I support the recommendation by staff. Um, I think they've outlined um, solid justifications for how they came to their conclusion. And I will be voting in support of that recommendation. Thank you, Chelsea. John or Ronnie? I was wondering if staff could maybe comment on um, the conversation about the easement. Um, you know, I think Peter was asking kind of a direct question about the review and also the applicability of that content in the um, case tonight. I, I can speak to that a bit. Um, so the easement issue isn't really uh, germane to the discussion of whether or not the board wishes to follow staff recommendation or do, or do something else. Um, so I, I do kind of agree with uh, uh, Pete's assessment that it is a bit of a, um, uh, for a potential discussion down the road, but isn't really something that the landmarks board needs to sort out because it is outside of the building. Thank you. Yeah, I have some things to throw in on the, the issues that are really at hand. The issue of, of possible, um, I guess, sufficient quality to consider designating or at least to consider exploring it. it on, I think that the thing that I'm not going to necessarily challenge, but the thing that I think 
needs to be discussed is the environmental issue that was one of the arguments for um, not designating or, or not exploring. And the fact that the environment around the house has been changed as significantly as it has renders the house no longer, I guess, valid as a as a historic candidate. Um, I have to take issue with that, not in this specific case, but in general, in the sense that it's not uncommon to see a, a remnant piece of architecture that has been surrounded by a heavily altered context and the value of that piece isn't diminished necessarily by that. In fact, it's also arguable, and probably this is the reason for the easement, that preserving that building, at least the scale and mass of that building in that space, um, helps preserve the environmental quality of the two adjacent larger properties and does not make them pen hemmed in by if somebody put a sliver three-story building in there up to the absolute limit, assuming they could. Um, I think those are, I, th I think that's something that we need to consider a little further. As, as for whether the house is, is I guess, of a quality that we should consider preserving it, I think there are a lot of issues with this house. And what was presented um, shows that it is gonna need a new foundation. If, if a decision was taken to preserve it, it would need to be lifted and refounded on a better foundation um, than a rubble foundation. It probably would need to be pretty thoroughly gutted and rebuilt from the inside out, all the systems. And those are all considerations um, in the sense of what the expense of those things would be and so on. Um, but I'm kind of leaning towards wanting to know more about this building and this environment. Ronnie, do you mind if I jump in after, because of what John just said, it kind of um, helps me with my thoughts. While I always appreciate staff's expertise and their, their rationale for everything, I actually would be in support of a stay for this. Um, one of the things most intriguing to me is that if in fact it's the Jonas Anderson that was you know, very pivotal in the creation and really helped shape the boulder that we have today early on, I would be interested in knowing more about that. And I feel like the only way to do that is through a stay. Um, I do understand where the easement is a, another issue for for others and not something we should look at tonight. But I, I also, um, I'm so aware of the other wonderful historic buildings around here. And John, I wanted to jump in after you because I agree that, that yes, some context is lost. Yes, there's been some modifications to the building, but it's still standing. It's an, it's an older building here in Boulder. And I, I just think a stay would give us a chance to really explore more about it. Yeah, Abby, um, I agree with you. Um, I think that if you look at the immediate context, the buildings to the east and the west, um, clearly the small house is engulfed. Um, and the environmental significance criteria I think when you look at it, um, just on those three buildings um, seems to have significantly diminished um, this particular um, criteria item for this this home. But I do agree that uh, further evaluation needs to be um, made on this particular property. And I think it is compelling to see the broader image of 
um, the neighboring buildings in the overall block and what other historic structures are there. Um, and I agree with um, Abby and John in this case that uh, this in this particular case, I think uh, stay would benefit us. Now, I don't know if there's any more discussion. Um, I want to take the time we need to do this. And um, I don't know if anyone's ready to make a motion. Um, Chelsea, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I thought earlier Claire had mentioned that in the presentation they would be talking about any like costs associated or the conditions of the house or costs associated with refurbishing or redevelop i don't know i i thought i heard that that was going to be talked about but i wasn't sure that i heard that. that chelsea my understanding was that no information other than the provided imagery was provided in terms of cost. Maybe I'm incorrect. That's what, yeah, Claire said that in the, but, but that in the presentation there would be something. So I don't know, Claire, if maybe you want to clarify. Oh, uh, John is correct. Just, there was just the additional imagery from Pete. Okay. And the, um, the issue of the floodplain, so like the house would have to be lifted and a new foundation would have to be put in if, if this were to be landmarked and and uh modified correct i don't believe that um do we have that information yet pete is that something oh, that somebody you know? said that uh yeah if i can um the we are in the 500 year floodplain not the 100 year floodplain and um, my understanding is that there would not be the need to raise the building for purposes of the floodplain. Um, okay. the, the condition of the foundation is such that um, our research is that putting all the money into the rest of the work that needs to be done, that you would want to fix the foundation as well, which could be um, certainly at least a bunch of repair, but could be a full replacement. Um, and I think that's what John was referring to when he mentioned lift and replace. And, and Pete, did did you not um, kind of mention uh, a ballpark figure of uh, the cost of uh, full renovation? Yeah, you know, we did not do a line item cost estimate. Um, so don't have a, a firm number. It's certainly in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but um, I don't have a I don't have a number for you. Okay, and um, would it be possible to ask the applicants if they would how they feel about having to have a stay of demolition and like working with staff to um, try to see what can be done with the structure um, without demolishing it? Well, Ernie, maybe you can speak to that. I think that the time would be extremely unfortunate um, to wait 180 days, to wait half a year. Um, the Silpers are uh, trying to sell this property and move on with their life. And um, that time is significant in this case. Um, these are two individuals who have been in that building for a long time, and uh, right now it's an albatross for them. It is not. Um, it is not an asset. Um, until no one, no one wants to buy this building. Um, no one wants it in its current condition, and um, and being being allowed to tear it down makes it much more attractive. I'm sorry, but that's the fact. Um, I know why you're all here, and I appreciate the work that you do, but that's the reality of this. Um, it's a thousand square feet. Um, on a nice piece of property, and um, it is it requires way too much money to to fix it up. And um, 180 days would be significant for Ernie and his wife. And um, we really would urge you not to do that. I agree. Thank okay. you for expressing that. I just want to 
follow up just because I mean I understand the rest of the board. It seems like do want to, um, or I've heard from the majority of the rest of the board that they want to put the stay of demolition on. Um, it does seem like the applicants have looked at other potential options and the costs associated with redeveloping. Like I, I just often question, and this is sort of not specific to this project, but the amount of time and money and pressure and resources that, that we put, like these people's like livelihoods are in our hands because we want to like, oh, let's just like see if we can do something when the, like we, we basically have the information that says that we can't. And so I would just urge us to make these hard decisions sooner rather than later so that people can people can move on um, with their lives and and you know this this property, even in its current form, it's not the highest use of what can be done in this area. Clearly, it's an area that could use more housing. Um, and if it had, you know, the density that surrounds it, if, if this property could have even a fraction of that density for this property would serve much more than um, being an homage to a time that, you know, this is close. There's a lot of historic landmarks like in this area, I don't think that this serves the community um, and it's it's not the highest use for the property. So I would urge us to take the staff recommendation and, and just make this decision now um, instead of making the applicant go through this onerous long process. Uh, thank you, Chelsea. And, and of course, I don't know if uh... The easement, how much density it would even permit on that until that that's looked at um, on a separate track. Um, I I also want to remind my colleagues that a stay is not to exceed 180 days. Um, so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, I'm still going to support placing a stay. I don't know what Ronnie and John your thoughts. I we we did an abbreviated stay on a very, well, it wasn't similar. It was a similar kind of a building over on, right. I think it was Bluebell or oh, right. it was in that area. And we did another one over there and the site visit convinced us to let that property go. Um, so that happened fairly quickly. I it, the, the unfortunate thing, the unfortunate position we're in on these types of of projects is we get um we get presented with them on the night of a meeting without prior knowledge of them because we're not really supposed to be um having prior knowledge of these and have to make a decision and we generally rely on staff's expertise on this. Um, I think that the I think that the thing that is that is, I guess, bending the decision is the adjacent historic properties on the Pearl side, and the fact that it is a fragment of something that kind of was cohesive at a different point in history and it's something that we need more time than one meeting to look at i i don't know how else to put it yeah and if i could jump in chelsea i think i agree with you about expedited process i think you've articulated that really well um and i don't want to you know, burden the applicants by putting them through something that's unnecessary. Um, I also recognize that the topic of the easement is outside of our purview, um, but the easement is actually such an important piece of this. Outside of the development right component, what I understand is that there's a pedestrian circulation that occurs around this building and is linked to the park system in front of the home. 
Um, the way that people might interact with this building is very different than just the disposition of driving down Canyon. And similar to having a historic structure on a corner, which all of the other historic structures, I believe that were presented in that map that the neighbors put up were on the corners in a similar way that they are, you know, on display in the public realm in a unique way, this building may be doing that as well because of the easement implication on use around the structure. So it, it, it initially, it seemed to me, based on staff's presentation, that this building was hidden and that it was experienced via driving on Canyon and that it was engulfed between two large buildings. And that was the general, that was, that was the description of the context. And now that I have heard tonight from the public and kind of seen other graphics, personally, I think it would be valuable to look at this house again. Um, and I don't know if I've crossed the line with bringing the topic of the easement back up, um, but I think outside of the development potential and the highest and best use piece, um, the ability to interact with this structure and for it to be, you know, part of the public realm in a different way than I think it was initially perceived, at least I initially perceived it, um, has changed my perspective on it. And so I feel like it would be beneficial for us um, to evaluate this in that context to get a better understanding of the more diminutive historic structures that are nearby um, and how this building actually is what, you know, to what degree it is part of the public realm. Thank you, Ronnie. And of course I welcome any other dialogue from um, my colleagues, um, but I also, did want to see if there was um, a board member who wanted to put a motion forward as well. Yeah, I, I can make the motion. Go ahead, Chelsea. Oh, I was just going to ask if in the um, with the goal of potentially an expedited stay, could we shorten it to 60 days? I would support a shortened stay. I would also. And, and so I guess before we go to the motion, um, in light of the way that I've described the characteristic of the easement, I'm wondering if... Um, the attorney can speak to our ability to understand um, the implications of the easement to, you know, over the course of the stay. Sure. Um, so it's not part of the criteria, you know, worrying about what will happen, like what will be, if the, if, if the board decided to, you know, let this property get demolished, it's not part of the criteria in that decision, you know, what's going to come next. Uh, that's not, that's not part of the criteria. And that's kind of how I view the, the issue of the easement is starting to worry about, you know, once, once this, this if, and once this property uh, gets redeveloped, what happens, what does that redevelopment look like? And um, that's just not part of the criteria. And it is kind of getting into a bit of dangerous legal uh, area uh, using that and basing any decisions off of off of that. Yeah, I think I understand that piece of it. It the if the house was I, I know this isn't the case, but if the house was next to a pocket park, let's just say it was just written as that. Um, I think our understanding and perception of the public's engagement with the property would be different than what I think I initially understood through just having read the staff report. And so that's why I'm 
wondering what the easement is and what the consequence of the easement might be. I, I do think that it, without getting into the legal weeds, I think it is something in this case to consider is the, the fact that the easement and the intrusion into the property line, at some point, somebody is going to be a potential buyer is going to be doing due diligence and is going to try to look at what the entitlements on that property are going to be. And the envelope, the buildable envelope is going to, at that point, get redrawn, even if the house isn't there. And if the house is there, the property line issue is kind of moot as we've seen in other cases. I, I think that we're not supposed to consider it, but it is a consideration because I think the, the best and highest use of this property may already be visible. And, and again, have... best and highest use is not part of the criteria as to whether or not to uh, do a stay yeah. or issue a permit for demolition. So it's not really Landmarks Board um, scope uh, to consider, uh, you know, what is the absolute best use of this property. It's 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 to apply the historic preservation criteria in deciding whether or not this particular property meets the criteria or doesn't meet the criteria. And and, and if we start, you know, we're all we're all human, and we and we bring our 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 full selves into everything that we do, and so it's normal to want to think about things like best use, but um, it could, it, it, again, it could be problematic legal grounds um, on a potential appeal if somebody doesn't like the decision that you make. Um, right. If, if we start basing decisions off of things that are outside the criteria. Th right, Thank so I think for bringing that, that, that. And, and I understand that, um, Christopher, I, I think my, perspective on the easement is more about it the impact of the public's ability to be near and the ways in which they experience the building so it's not about the development potential of it it is the difference between like i was saying the building being in on a corner lot or the building being next to a park or the building being sandwiched between multifamily buildings in which, you know, it is, you know, all privatized land that doesn't get public activity up against it. Mm -hmm. Ronnie, if I could just point out one thing, the, the easement is for the benefit of 624 Pearl. I believe the way it's, I believe that's the way that it's written is not a public access easement. So while there's no fences here, um, a, my understanding is that it is not a public easement, it is for the benefit of 624. Okay. Okay. Well, that's helpful. And, and I, Chris, I so appreciate your comments about this since I know we aren't really supposed to look at best and highest use as well as. I know not consider the easement. Um, my point for me tonight is that I still, without even knowing there was an easement or without that, that I think this historic resource deserves a stay of demolition and that there's probable cause to believe it's eligible for individual landmark designation, especially to explore the Jonas Anderson connection. In, during the board's uh, discussion about putting a shorter stay of demolition, could I um, suggest that rather than a, a 60 day stay, the board picks the next regularly scheduled um, landmarks board meeting close to 60 days. Otherwise, your hands will be pretty tied with only having one meeting between now and the end of the stay. So that would be June 6th. June 5th? June 6th. Is it? Uh, yeah, that's the, that's approximately 60 days hence. Yeah, that, that makes sense. 
And that would be the day after your June 5th meeting. Yeah. Got it, Marcy. I hear what you're saying. Because otherwise, you'd have to have it before. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> So Ronnie, were you um, entertaining making? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I still feel like the sixty-day stay to get greater clarity, if possible, is an appropriate route. Um, and so, if someone could pull up the language, I can make that motion. Okay. I move that the landmarks please. board. Yeah, Sorry. that's okay. Um, I move that the landmarks board adopt the findings of the staff memorandum dated April third, twenty. 24 and issue a stay of demolition for the building located at 613 Walnut Street expiring on June 6th. Let me keep going. In order to explore alternatives to demonstrate to, uh, to, dem of, to demolishing the building. Thank you. Do we have a second? I, I'll second. Thank you, John. On a motion by Ronnie, seconded by John, we'll take a roll call vote. Chelsea? Aye. Um, John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote aye, so the uh, motion passes unanimously. And then Claire, if you will just take a few minutes to explain to the applicants next steps. Yes, uh, so the, the board has placed a stay of demolition until June 6th on the property. Um, and this will allow the, the board to um, have some discussions uh, about um, any options that are available to help preserve the building. Um, we will be in touch to schedule some meetings and um, we'll do that pretty quickly uh, as soon as we have a compressed timeline here. Um, are there um, two board members who um, would like to uh, be representatives during this day? I, I will volunteer. I'll volunteer. All right, thank you. So we will, uh, we will be in touch. And I would just say, like, if you guys, obviously this happens, but when and if there's a, a site visit, you know, I think it'd be great if we could all go do that. I think so. Good point. Um, now we're on to our next public hearing. I don't know if the board or anyone else um, from the city, if you'd like to take a five minute break before we begin the next public hearing? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll be back at, at 8.03 p.m. Thank you, guys.
Abby, I am um, going to just keep my camera off for a minute and okay. Okay. eat some dinner while we go through this case. Okay, are we all back? I see Marcy's queued up and ready for the next public hearing. I'm ready and I think we're just um, confirming. Chelsea, are you back online? Sorry, yes, back. <laughs> Thanks, Chelsea. So we'll we'll move on to uh, agenda item 5B. This is public hearing and consideration of a landmark alteration certificate application to demolish the existing building and construct a new 2,800 square foot house and a thousand square foot accessory building at 520 Pearl Street a non-contributing property in the West Pearl Historic District pursuant to section 91118 of the Boulder Revised Code and under the procedures prescribed by chapter one through three quasi-judicial hearings. And thank you to the owners who have agreed to this virtual format. And Marcy, I know you will be doing this presentation. Wonderful. So I will start with the quasi-judicial hearing process, which begins uh, with all speaking to the item will be sworn in. If you're speaking under um, open comment or public comment, you'll do that at the time that you speak. Um, board members will then note any ex parte contacts, and then I'll give a staff presentation followed by board questions. The applicant will then have 10 minutes to present, followed by questions from the board. The public hearing is then opened for public comment for three minutes each, followed by board questions. And then after the last uh, public comment speaker uh, has finished, the applicant will have a chance to respond to anything that was said. The public hearing is then closed and the board discusses. And a motion requires an affirmative vote of at least three members to pass. Motions must state findings, conclusions, and a recommendation. And finally, a record of the hearing will be available. So I'll turn it back to you, Abby, for uh, ex parte contacts. Thank you. I have none. Chelsea? None. John? John, any ex parte? None. Thank you. And Ronnie? None. Thank you. Back to you, Marcy. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So uh, this is a different case type than the one we just reviewed, uh, which was a non-designated demolition. This is a landmark alteration certificate for the demolition of an existing building and construction in the West Pearl Historic District. The criteria for the board's review is found in uh, section 911.18 of the Boulder Revised Code. And that is that the proposed work preserves, enhances, or restores and does not damage exterior architectural features of the property, that the work does not adversely affect the historic architectural value of the property, and the architecture, arrangement, texture, color, arrangement of color, and materials are compatible with the character of the property in the historic district, and that the Landmarks Board uh, will consider the economic feasibility of alternatives, incorporation of energy efficient design, and enhanced access for the disabled indoor uh, decision. Your options tonight are to either approve the um, uh, landmark alteration certificate application or approve it with conditions. Um, that is subject to a city council call up or you could deny the application um, and that decision is subject to a 30 call up period by city council. Um, you could also provide the applicant the opportunity to withdraw the application, which is generally the board's practice, if the landmarks board members are heading towards um, towards the agency. And I might pause here. Don, I think there might be some background noise from your microphone. Um, that Would you mind trying to mute your computer? Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So um, because uh, demolition and 
new freestanding construction over 340 square feet is required by code to be reviewed in a public hearing. Uh, none of you Landmarks Board members have seen this application uh, previously. So uh, we've met with the architects and the owners uh, a few times as they were developing plans, um, but the Landmark Alteration Certificate was submitted on March 9th, and uh, here we are in April for the Landmarks Board meeting. The uh, property is located, as I mentioned, in the West Pearl Historic District. It's on the south side of Pearl Street, um, between 5th and 6th Streets. And as you can see, the West Pearl Historic District is just um, three blocks along Pearl Street and then one block along Canyon Boulevard. And there's actually two small parks within its boundaries, the Fullen Park and Fortune Park. The uh, property here, just a moment. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, here are some uh, photographs of the existing property. Um, as you can see, it's a one story cross gable frame uh, building that uh, um, was constructed in the 1890s and then significantly altered uh, in the 1970s. Here's a photograph of the tax assessor card from uh, between 1934 and 1949. So you can see while the overall form um, is still intact, the form and massing of the house remains, the design of the building has been significantly altered with new siding and window and door openings and a small addition has been added beneath the front porch um, and four bay windows have been added as well. Let's see. Oops, excuse me. So the um, uh, West Pearl Historic District was designated in 1994. And the following uh, year, there was a proposal uh, for a second story addition and um, a second story addition and, and addition and uh, garage proposed here. So going back and looking at what past landmarks boards have determined in terms of whether this is a contributing or non-contributing building, the 1987 historic building inventory form found that this L-shaped building, which has retained its basic shape and form, but which has been entirely remodeled with new siding, windows, and doors. The building originally had clappered siding and narrow double hung windows. Built around 1883, this building has been remodeled beyond its historic integrity. And um, at each of the um, reviews in uh, the 1994 creation of the West Pearl Historic District, the 1995 Landmarks Board Review, and then again, uh, a review in 2006 and 2007, the Landmarks Board at that time uh, did determine this building to be non-contributing to the historic character of the West Pearl Historic District. Uh, we don't have plans for the 1995 uh, review. It ultimately wasn't approved, um, but, uh, the proposal included adding a second story and an addition to the existing house, construction of a detached three-car garage, and that application was withdrawn. Uh, in 2006, there was another proposal. Uh, this time, it included um, preserving the original um, building and restoring it back based on the tax assessor photograph, and then adding a 2,800-square-foot addition and attached garage. And um, the application was withdrawn to allow uh, time for redesign. And here's the um, east elevation of the of that uh, proposal there that you can see goes from the small house and then um, kind of two similar shapes and then connects to the, uh, the attached garage at the back. In 2007, so really just a month later uh, after that previous review, um, the owners returned with revised design, which was a two-story, 2,100-square-foot addition and 500-square-foot detached garage. Uh, the height at its maximum was 25 feet tall and included the restoration of the original house. The application was conditionally approved by the Landmarks Board, and that included a condition to reduce the garage to 400 square feet in size. The landmark alteration certificate was issued, but the project was not built. And I give you all um, 
this context uh, not as precedent or like the only solution for what can be done on this property, but more as context for what uh, the volunteer members in your position uh, have determined in the past. And so um, this approval has long since expired, um, but uh, going into the history of the case, uh, it has been through the Landmarks Board process um, a few times. So now coming into the 21st century, we'll go to the current proposal, which you can see on the site plan here on the left, uh, includes the construction of uh, the main house here, and then a two uh, car garage at the rear with a, um, a unit above. Uh, the proposed house is just under 2,800 square feet with a maximum of 35 uh, feet in height. 34 feet wide, and then the construction of a approximately 1,000 square foot garage. The um, north elevation is the one that faces uh, West Pearl Street. And you can see uh, it is a traditional gable form with a front facing gable with a secondary nestled gable um, on the west side. It incorporates traditional elements, including the um, shed roof porch. Uh, and gable roofs with uh, shed dormers. Uh, the building is located in the 500 year floodplain, and so the building is raised up on uh, a stone foundation here. Moving around to the west elevation, um, you can see that the building has three shed roof dormers uh, continuing back, and then um, a irregular pattern of uh, horizontal and vertically proportioned uh, casement windows, and then the footprint of the house insets at the southwest corner of the property, providing a covered outdoor space with the second floor cantilevered above. And then moving around to the rear of the property, um, which has some visibility from the alleyway, which is a public right of way, but is generally considered a tertiary elevation, you can see the um, predominant gable form continues to the back with uh, a trellis with a projecting um, balcony and then um, a window pattern with sliding glass doors as shown uh, in the drawing. And then moving around to the east elevations, um, similar to the west elevation with a series of shed roof dormers um, whose uh, start below the ridge the porch extends towards the front of the house, and then there are um, not many windows on the front of or on the first floor of this elevation, um, with just the three as shown there with the chimney towards the, the back that bisects the dormer. The proposed um, materials would be uh, wood, state, wood siding that is either stained or painted, um, that's a vertical wood siding and then um, a stone at the chimney and the foundation, uh, a standing seam metal roof, and then the transom windows um, as shown in the drawings. And this uh, elevation shows the relationship between the proposed house and the proposed accessory building. And then um, going through understanding kind of the um, mass and form of the building through the 3D modeling, this also helps illustrate the material palette that is proposed. Moving to the proposed garage, it is um, a gable form uh, with uh, flat roof dormers on both, both slopes of the roof with a projecting uh, balcony to towards the west. Looking at the south elevation, which faces the alleyway, there's a single um, garage door opening facing the alleyway with a rectangular window in the um, flat roof dormer and then the balcony, as you can see, to the west. And then moving around to the west elevation, um, there are two doors, one accessing the garage, one accessing the unit with uh, sliding glass doors and uh, windows in the dormer. And then moving around, um, this is the elevation that faces the interior of the lot, and it has two um, kind of uh, stepped windows on this elevation and one in the in the dormer. And then moving around to the east elevation, there's a single uh, opening in the dormer 
um, there that's a small rectangular window. The material palette for the uh, proposed garage is similar to that of the house with vertical uh, painted or stained um, wood siding, a standing seam metal roof, and a stone foundation. Moving into the staff analysis of the code criteria and the um, design guidelines, uh, I've already gone through the standards for the issuance of the landmark alteration certificate, which talks about whether the work proposed, uh, preserves, enhances, or restores and does not damage or destroy the exterior architectural features of the um, historic district, does the proposed application adversely affect the special character or special historic, architectural, or aesthetic interest or value of the property? And then the next one is about materials, colors, and textures. And then uh, with respect to the proposal to demolish a building in a historic district, that the proposed new construction to replace the building meets the requirements in two and three uh, above. So um, the first um, kind of component is the demolition of the existing building. And staff agree with the past determination that the existing house is non-contributing due to the extent of alterations. And the um, West Pearl Historic District design guidelines are unique in that it encourages preservations of what they call supporting features of non-contributing buildings. Um, staff considers that we need to look at the building and its merits on its own. And due to the extent of alterations, we feel this is a non-contributing building, therefore its demolition would be appropriate. Second, while the proposed house includes architectural details that are reflective of contributing buildings within the historic district, the overall mass and scale window pattern and metal roof are out of character with the historic district. And the proposed two-story height garage door opening, dormer size balcony and window pattern of the garage uh, staff considers are inconsistent with the design guidelines. In terms of the materials and colors, um, staff find that the style, arrangement, texture, color, and arrangement of color may be appropriate and compatible with the site. Um, however, the use of metal roofing is not consistent with the design guidelines or generally the character of the West Pearl Historic District. Metal roofs were found um, historically in Boulder. Um, to our knowledge, there aren't any existing metal roofs in the West Pearl Historic District. And then um, staff considers that the new construction proposed to replace the existing building uh, does not meet the requirements of um, two and three as described above. So going into the key design, design guidelines for the house and um, our full analysis is in the memo and, and in the attachment of the design guidelines. Um, but these are really the key design guidelines uh, to highlight in this presentation. Um, the, one key component is the height, mass, and scale of the proposed house. Uh, the general design guidelines, section six, um, say that the new construction should be compatible with surrounding buildings in terms of height, size, scale, massing, and proportions. And the West Pearl Historic District is really characterized by smaller buildings, one and one and a half stories tall. There are two uh, contributing two-story buildings. However, the scale of those two-story buildings is um, is a bit smaller in terms, not solely in height, but in terms of massing. The mass and scale of the new construction should respect neighboring buildings in the streetscape, and the historic heights and widths, as well as their ratios, should be maintained, especially the proportions of the facade. Uh, new construction should respect the historic character of the district and incorporate the elements which contribute to the character such as mass, roof lines, windows, doors, bays, and porches. Uh, modern expressions of traditional elements are encouraged. And I, I credit the architect for um, going that direction with the style of the building. I think the, the guidelines that we found it was inconsistent with um, mainly are the mass and scale and height of the building. In terms of the site plan, there's um, the guideline 2.7 in site uh, design that uh, talks about preserving a backyard area between the house and garage, maintaining the general proportion of built mass to open space found in the area. So while there are, um, I think, a, 
a larger proportion of built mass to open space than found in other districts. Um, this one seems to be on the, the higher end in terms of, of built mass. In terms of the windows and doors, some key design guidelines include design the spacing, placement, scale, orientation, proportion the size of window and door openings in new structures to be compatible with the surrounding building that contribute to the historic district while reflecting the underlying design of the new building. Select windows and doors that are compatible in material subdivision proportion pattern and detail of the windows and doors surrounding buildings that contribute to the historic district. And that windows in a new building or in addition should reflect the fenestration pattern in the district. Then picture windows, large walls of glass, uh, snap and mullions and prefabricated bay windows are generally inappropriate. And looking at the contributing buildings in the West Pearl Historic District, while there is, I think, eclectic character, generally it's a regular pattern of vertically proportioned, um, double hung windows or, you know, that vertical proportion. Um, uh, so in terms of referencing contributing buildings, that seems to be the general pattern in the West Pearl District. And then in terms of materials and porches, materials should be similar in scale proportion, texture, finish, and color to those found on nearby historic structures. And new porches should incorporate traditional um, massing and updating details in the design. So the porch one, the porch actually meets the design guidelines. We had a very minor uh, uh, comment about how the base of the porch or the foundation should align with uh, the railing rather than um, protruding beyond it. In terms of the materials, um, I think that is uh, something for the board's discussion about the appropriateness of um, stained wood uh, the, um, and the metal roof itself. In our analysis, we found that um, it wasn't consistent with the character of the um, contributing buildings, um, but I do think that is something we're, we're interested in hearing the board's discussion on, as with all of these points. So, um, in our design guideline summary, uh, we identified um, key points that were uh, inconsistent with the design guidelines. So um, to summarize, it's the um, mass and scale, the proportion of built mass to open space, the window and door size, proportion, and pattern, the roof material, and then the porch slab uh, depth on the front of the house. Moving next to the uh, proposed new accessory building, the key design guidelines include uh, section uh, seven in the general design guidelines. New garages for single family residences should generally be one story tall and shelter no more than two cars. In some cases, two car garages may be inappropriate. The roof form and pitch should be complementary to the primary structure. And new garages should, and this is in the West Pearl Historic District, that states new garages should generally be one story tall and shelter no more than two cars. They should be simpler in design and detail than the main building. And if dormers are to be added to an accessory structure, they should be placed in an unobtrusive location and kept small. Dormer styles should be appropriate to the style of the building and compatible to the main roof form, and dormer ridge lines should be lower than the main roof ridge. Uh, continuing, the garage doors should be consistent with the historic scale and materials of traditional accessory structures. Wood is the most appropriate material and two smaller doors may be more appropriate than one large door. The use of two smaller garage doors rather than one large door is also encouraged in the West Pearl Historic District, it states, because it is in keeping with the existing small scale of the neighborhood. And then um, for the balcony, uh, key design guidelines include because decks are not traditionally found on historic structures, they should be avoided or their appearance should be minimized. Decks should be subordinate to the house in terms of scale and detailing, avoid cantilevered projections from the building and use appropriately scaled brackets or supports. So to summarize uh, the design guidelines around the garage, significantly reducing the size of the dormer so the primary roof form is gabled and no more than one and a half story. Uh, revising the design of the window and doors to reflect the revised fenestration of the house. Revising the design to have two garage doors openings rather than a single opening 
and then revising the design to eliminate the balcony from the accessory building. Um, these would have all been uh, conditions had our recommendation been for approval, but in going through our design guideline analysis, we felt that there were um, a number of key design guidelines that the design was inconsistent with that we ultimately are uh, recommending um, that the Landmarks Board uh, deny this application, um, but we look forward to the board's discussion um, to provide uh, feedback for the applicant and the owners in a redesign. Um, and so with that, uh, our staff recommendation of uh, just concluded. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions from the board that you may have. I don't have any. And I don't see John, Ronnie, or Chelsea. Uh, Ronnie, do you have any questions of staff? No, nope, none for me. Thank you. And Chelsea and John, I don't see that you have any. Uh, Martha, you did such an amazing job that we don't have any questions for you at this point. So, so with that, it's time to move on to the applicant presentation. The applicant will have 10 minutes and several different people can speak um, for a total of the 10 minutes and we will need to swear all speakers in. Well, let me switch over to my facilitating window here. Um, let's see. And let me see. Okay. All right. So I think we'll promote Jeff as well. All right, Jeff, you should see a pop-up to be promoted to a panelist. And Michael, I believe you already have one. Can you let us know if um, there is anyone else in attendance that we need to promote for either your applicant presentation or answering uh, questions from the board? Okay, now I can unmute myself. I think it's just myself and Jeff. Wonderful. responding to questions. So I swear to tell the truth. <laughs> Thank you. And did you want to swear in Jeff now as well? Yeah, Jeff, I'll go ahead and swear you in. And then when you both start speaking, when the clock starts, uh, do say your full name again for the record. So Jeff, if you would be kind enough to um, say you'll swear to tell the board the full truth. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Van Sandvik, and I, I swear to tell the truth. Okay, thank you so much. And Michael, are you starting off? Yes, I will be doing okay. the presentation. Okay, thank you. Please. Okay. Speak. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm Michael Stoll, and one of the owners, along with Lon Tran, that will be presenting, along with our architects, Jeff uh, and Matt. So the next slide, please. Uh, so just to give you some background, so we have been living in this house now for 15 plus years. Uh, we're both sort of residents of Boulder for 20 plus years. Uh, and the project motivations really are the current physical state of the home, uh, as well as importantly, recent floodplain changes. Marcy, you said 500 year floodplain. It's actually the 100 year floodplain uh, that this property is in, as well as the fact that the uh, recent wildfire concerns in this house is basically a, a tinderbox. Uh, and in addition to that is we want to put in a home that's going to be energy efficient and sustainable, uh, taking into all those factors and obviously increase the livable space for us uh, in Boulder. And another important factor is uh, to provide an ADU. So there's some additional living space uh, to increase the living space density in Boulder. Next slide, please. Uh, and so from the design criteria, we wanted to include features of the original home, uh, not as not not just as it exists now, but the the older home as well, uh, and include elements of this historic district, obviously, and massing that's similar to adjacent contributing structures. So all of those criteria that uh, were alluded to earlier by Marcy. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so there are some obvious design constraints here that we're dealing with. And one of the major ones is the recent floodplain changes, which means we're in the 100 year floodplain. And so we have to basically lift the building about three feet off of grade. Uh, and that's one of the aspects of the height of the building, perhaps uh, being a bit higher because of that floodplain issue. And of course, the one and a half story max building. So we're not putting in a two story building. It is a one and a half story building. But increasing those dormer sizes and things is necessary to provide livable uh, space on the, on the second floor. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just reiterating that uh, this is the floodplain map showing the subject property there where uh, the pro all the prior reviews were not in that 100-year uh, floodplain. They were in the 500 years. So that's why they were thinking they could just sort of maintain that structure. Uh, but now that's not really a viable option. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so what I wanted to walk through is a couple of design comparisons because one of the concerns, of course, was the massing of the structure. And I think it's important to recognize there's there's a couple of ways to consider the massing in regards to the perspective of somebody on Pearl Street, walking down Pearl Street in relationship to the other structures. And so I've just put together a few slides where I've scaled them in accordance with their distance from Pearl Street. So the next slide, please. So this shows uh, the proposed non-contributing structure next to the existing structure at uh, the scale that you would see a sort of standing right in front of the home on the sidewalk at that distance. Both of these structures would be at the 25 foot setback according to code. Um, and you'll see that sort of, we had to raise things up it's probably going to be a little bit higher than that. Uh, these are not perfect scales, but they're pretty close. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this shows 508 Pearl, which is only one uh, house down from the, uh, the actual subject property. Uh, that's a substantially larger contributing home. It's 3,200 plus square foot uh, property. Uh, and it's at roughly at about the same distance from uh, the sidewalk. It's a little bit closer. So it looks about the same massing and scale. Um, and then the next slide, please. Uh, this is 320 Pearl, which is also a contributing structure in the area. Uh, smaller home, 2,300 square feet, uh, somewhat comparable in size. Both have a 25 foot setback. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is a comparison to 406 Pearl, which is a recently built structure, non-contributing, but in the historic district. Uh, this structure is actually at 15 feet. And so that's why it, it's actually, even though it's roughly the same size as the proposed structure, it looks substantially larger when you're basically standing uh, right there on Pearl Street. And then the next slide is the ADU uh, design. So while looking at the code, of course, that's in relationship to a garage uh, primarily and not in relationship to putting in an ADU. So we were, we did have some criteria and constraints in regards to the, the ADU. One is the height restrictions because we did wanna have some living space above the garage, not just simply a garage. And of course, the same floodplain restrictions that we were dealing with. And we wanted it to, to be concordant with the main home in regards to design. But of course, uh, a key criteria and why those sort of larger dormers, apparently larger dormers, uh, is to make sure that it's a livable space for somebody, a one bedroom livable space. Um, and then the next slide uh, is showing the, the ADU um, in relationship to that and just showing that height restriction and why those dormers are sort of all the way up there to give that livable space um, above the garage. And the next slide is to talk about some of the proposed exterior materials, which Marcy mentioned, uh, and the wood siding and then the stone and the metal roof. So if you go to the next slide, I just took a couple examples so in regards to the wood siding and the stained, uh, it's similar to the current home with that vertical uh, wood paneling. And it's also very similar to a contributing structure at 439 Canyon, which has this dark brown 
or it did at one point. I'm not sure if it still does. This is a picture from, uh, from, I'm not sure. I think I got it from you, Marcy, perhaps. I'm not sure. Uh, that shows that same. So that's why we're choosing that. It, it's related to that. On the next slide, uh, the reason we're choosing the seam metal roofing, uh, it was not necessarily common in Boulder, but there are a number of homes around. In fact, 229 Fifth Street is uh, less than a block away from the subject party uh, property. Um, that's sort of where we got that inspiration. And that was kind of driven out of a couple things. Uh, we didn't we don't see that a lot in Boulder, but there are some historic homes with this seam metal roofing, and it is a unique feature that we felt would be nice to bring back into that property. And then the next slide is just showing the stone aspect and where the inspiration kind of came for that stone skirting. 308 Pearl, which is just up, up the street uh, from us, is completely stone, and that's a landmark building, of course. And then 438, that's not very far away, has sort of a stone uh, porch feature to it. Um, and those are both contributing homes and, and went into the design feature of that. And then I think on the next slide was just sort of a project summary. Uh, in Portland, it's a non-contributing structure, if you heard, as you heard. And the goal is to uh, remove the house, um, but rebuild it with historical features that are similar to contributing homes in the area. And uh, also using some of the design elements of the prior home and to mass and scale it comparable to nearby contributing structures. However, with that uh, caveat that we're sort of stuck with this change in the floodplain and we have to raise the whole property up. And we're certainly amenable to work with staff to modify things. And I think I have one more slide which is just some specific responses and comments. Uh, and so in regards to the primary house, uh, the mass and scale, in our opinion, reflects uh, contributing buildings. In fact, the closest contributing building is, is actually larger than what's being proposed for the main home. Uh, the seam metal roofing is observed on contributing buildings nearby. Uh, of course, at the Mapleton Historic District. Um, and then certainly fenestration we can put all sorts of different windows in there, I think. Um, and the deck and trellis, alterable, porch, alterable. In regards to the ADU, uh, we certainly think we can alter the dormer size, but we really need to take into account how much livable space is in there. And some of the other things, certainly revising to a two-door garage is certainly alterable. Uh, the main focus on having that balcony is there is an ADU right next door, which has a similar structure, um, and it provides some outdoor space for somebody living up there and, and matches that, that non-contributing structure. And then there, the general comments, we certainly agree with all of that. So I'll leave my last nine seconds to Jeff, if he wants to add. I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I guess I, I mostly here to answer questions anyway, but I, I did want to, to, I guess, reiterate that um, I, I have a lot of familiarity with the zoning requirements, the floodplain requirements, all that stuff. So if there are specific questions about those and why we chose to make the choices we did, I'm happy to address those. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And both Michael and Jeff, you will be invited back for an additional three minutes after public comment. Do any of my colleagues have questions for Michael or Jeff at this point? None for me, Abby. Thank you, Ronnie. And I don't see John or Chelsea raising it. Oh, John, please. I don't have any questions. It's all pretty clear. <laughs> Thank you. And Chelsea, if you don't have any at this point, we'll move on to public participation. All right, so here is uh, your opportunity. If you'd like to speak to this item, go ahead and find the raise hand function. And Abby, we have two speakers uh, so far. The first, Dylan Williams, followed by Lynn Siegel. Thank you. And Dylan, I am going to ask you to uh, swear to tell the truth once again and state your full name, and then your three minutes will commence. So I swear to tell the truth. My full name is Dylan Williams. 
just wanted to say that I do walk by this property uh, very, very often. And um, I think it's important to note that because it's part of an historic district, that the all of the people in the district agreed when that district was created that this was that they wanted the district to look in in a certain way. And I think that that's really important here. Uh, when I look at the um, when I think back to all of the houses that I've passed along uh, Pearl Street, including this house, I have to say that I really disagree with the um, architects and the owner as to as to um, their statements that that this house uh, fits into the existing sort of um, feeling of of the neighborhood, and I think that I kind of agree with. Uh, what what the staff said of, about the massing and, and the architectural features really not being consistent with um, with the neighborhood. Uh, I was really kind of taken, I have to say, by the um, uh, application uh, that that was um, approved but but never acted on. I think that the idea of um, of uh, renovating, not, not, not renovating, but um, um, I, I would say uh, uh, restoring the original uh, house and then adding something to that, that that, that could be adapted to um, address the floodplain and the um, fire considerations that, that are uh, that, that were mentioned by the owner and the architect. And I think that that might actually provide a very nice template for how you might proceed, at least starting off with sort of in that in that direction. So uh, I think that that would do much more justice to the neighborhood and and the um, notion that that uh, people were trying to um, capture when they created the historic district. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. And Lynn, and you know, I'm going to ask you to swear to tell the truth and state your full name once again. Lynn Siegel, I swear to tell the truth to the best of my knowledge, my truth, not someone else's. Um, I'm not very religious and I don't believe in a truth. Um, so this is really a perfect example of what how I, I see the Landmarks Board having a complete overhaul to involve the Environmental Advisory Board, the Planning Board, and the Housing Advisory Board. Um, this, this house, I know this house. I really like this house. I love wood houses. Um, in spite of their fire capability, I also love 770 Circle, Flagstone, fireproof house that you demoed, okay? So you can't change things here. The point is, this has carbon footprint. That's costly. In spite of Chelsea Castellano and the bell rooms are for people and the build it, build it, build it, more for the developers, push, push, push for housing, housing everywhere, North Boulder last night at, at uh, I forget after a while, the planning board um, approved uh, light industrial to housing, everything. The other word for God is housing. And it, it's, it's just not true. It's not happening. So what we need is to preserve for our carbon footprint, these houses as much as we can. Now, if there's undue expenses on the part of the developer, then what needs to be done between EAB and planning board and HAB is there need to be a full life cycle analysis and embodied energy trade-offs between what's used to build the new, completely new house versus gut and, you know, and maybe lift up since all the houses in Boulder are on the 100-year floodplain, maybe lift up and um, augment the 
the, the lower part of the house, the junction with the land. So I agree with Dylan um, that, that, you know, much as this is a nice house and it fits in with the guidelines of the other aspects of generally of the um, West Pearl District, historic district, it really should, the first consideration should be retaining what we have, just like at 1015 Juniper, which was a giveaway, complete giveaway, and was very harmful to affordable housing. Oh, and that's the other thing. It, there needs to be a new housing affordable board because HAB doesn't really do that. But that's that's my thoughts on the place. Keep Thank it. You. Thank get you. it. Do it. Add add to it. You know the way it is. Thank you, Lynn. Your time has expired. Uh, Marcy, any other members of the public wish to address this item? Uh, I have not seen any others uh, participants with their hand raised. Um, so I think Abby is um, uh, fair to close the public comment period and turn it back to the owner and applicant to respond. Okay, thank you. The public hearing portion of this hearing is closed or public comment portion of this hearing is closed. And um, Jeff and Michael, you have an additional three minutes. Well, Michael, I'm happy to, to speak. Unless you yeah, want to go, go ahead, Jack. I, I heard myself for 10 minutes already. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I, I guess I, one thing I did want to bring up is is essentially the the overall design. I mean, what we what we have been trying to do with this design is is really lean into the idea of sort of a, a modern interpretation of the historic district that we're sitting in, uh, so that you know we're not trying to be rep replicative of existing houses in that district. We're not trying to to build something that looks like it's always been there. Um, we want to we want it to really be you know appropriate for the district of scale with the other houses in the district, but of its time, you know, of today, not of you know 100 years ago. Uh, you know, so to that end, I think the mass and form leans leans in that direction very strongly. I think the materials that we're proposing are very much of today, but still reflective of the materials that were used in the district and in Boulder, you know, overall. Um, I think even the window patterns that you know, I know there's a concern about the the proportions or the size of the windows that we're proposing. But, you know, to be to be honest, I, I think what we're trying to do there is is create a modern interpretation of the double hung windows that would have been seen in a, the original house. I feel like just putting double hung windows back in would be replicative as opposed to being a modern interpretation of those original styles. Um, the same with the metal roof, the same with um, you know, the, the, I don't know, the scale of the house. I think one of the challenges we've been facing on the garage that has been difficult uh, is really just the, the number of restrictions that are placed on, on this property with the, the zoning limitations. And I think it'd be very interesting to me to hear uh, from the board, you know, what, what the importance of an ADU is, whether or not that's something that should be encouraged in a historic district or discouraged in a historic district. Because if we're going to try to do that and provide that that opportunity for you know affordable housing in Boulder in the in the historic districts, um, but that's one avenue to get there. And I I think it would be interesting to get that feedback from the board. Um, and then at, so to that end, uh, you know, to to provide that ADU, we have um, we have uh, some pretty strong zoning restrictions on what that accessory structure can be, the mass, the scale. Um, all of that that are pretty much con you know, um, contradictory to the the historic district guidelines. So uh, I think some discussion from the board on on how to prioritize that or or what um, what opportunities there might be for the historic district to to be leveraged um, to allow for more opportunities uh, relative to what the zoning limits would be interesting to hear. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So we are now going to move on to board discussion. I ask that everyone else mute your computer or phone for the duration of this discussion. We've allotted approximately an hour for um, this discussion. And um, Marcy, I know you may have a slide that will help kind of guide our discussion. I 
it seems like there's a threshold question about whether the existing house um, is is eligible for demolition. And I don't know if you want us to discuss that first or separately, but I think I see it's number one on your. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a proposed framework for your discussion because there really are two, there are like three major um, components. One is the demolition of the existing building. Is that appropriate or not? Uh, second is about the house and you could break that down in terms of mass scale uh, location of the proposed building um, and then the roof forms and then the uh, scale placement location of windows and doors and then the proposed material and do a similar structure then for the garage. Um, of course, you're welcome to, to structure the discussion however you'd like, but this is a, a proposal to keep it uh, within a general time frame. Uh, thank you, Marcy. I personally would like to suggest we deal with question number one first, because then I think it, it makes the rest of the questions either very pertinent or not so pertinent. So um, that being said, um, I don't know if anyone would like to start, but I, I do agree with the current assessment and previous assessments that this is a non-contributing building in this historic district. And while I appreciate embodied energy and trying to rehabilitate or reuse whatever, um, I do think that this property could be demolished and re and this this lot redeveloped. Um, okay, maybe I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you stated that well, and uh, basically, I agree with staff's um, position on the demolition component of the historic building. And I also agree with Ronnie, Abby, and staff. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea and John. Okay, well, I I agree, but I could argue that any demolition in a historic district of a building that's been there for a long period of it is gonna have some effect as discussed by the members of the public who apparently walk by it fairly frequently. Um, <clears throat> but I think that in this case, I also looking at the condition of the building, just I, I don't think it's a major loss. So I can agree with staff that the site can be redeveloped. Um, however, the whole issue of, of the embodied energy, obviously, and it is now a matter of policy that if this building is properly deconstructed and there's some reuse found for the materials in it, that's gonna be of benefit to the uh, overall environment of Boulder. Thank you. Can I, just before we get too much further, um, Marcy, can you, could you, I guess, talk about what the implication, if, if we accept staff's recommendation and act accordingly, what are the implications of this for the uh, applicant? Are you speaking specifically about the determination whether this is contributing or non-contributing, or you're speaking more generally about an uh, approval of the approval or denial of the landmark alteration certificate. And your uh, microphone is muted. John, we didn't catch that. You're uh, muted. It, I'm I'm speaking specifically about approval or or disapproval of the demolition specifically or the full proposal the full proposal okay so if the uh if the landmarks board approves it uh most commonly with conditions that uh decision is subject to city council call up if council doesn't call it up then the conditions would be worked out typically at the landmarks design review committee meetings they would get a landmark alteration certificate and, and then apply for building permit if the 
Landmarks Board voted to deny the application, that uh, decision is subject to a 30-day call-up period by City Council, and if they chose not to um, call it up or if they agreed with the denial, then the uh, a substantially similar application couldn't be um, submitted for one calendar year. And then the third option is that if the board is heading towards a denial after uh, speaking about the design uh, review criteria, um, the board's practice has been to provide the owners of the applicant a chance to withdraw the application, at which case the case is, is closed out. The owners and the applicant would have your feedback to go make design revisions and then return to the full board with a, a new proposal. Thank you, Marcy. John, does that help? That does, that helps. So Marcy, I'm going to ask you again to go to, thank you. So I do think the next question is, is uh, these are perfectly, um, I think in a great order to um, look at. So I do think the next major question is, is the mass scale and location of the proposed building appropriate? And I don't know if there's anyone who would like to kick off the deliberations with about that. I can, if you'd like, Abby. Please. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, Jeff and Michael, I think that this is a beautiful building. Like without a doubt, I think that you have a very good looking building. I'm, I'm gonna tell you some pieces about it that I think are the parts that I think staff is pointing to that are the aspects about, about the overall like scale and geometry of the building that might be um, in conflict with the design guidelines. But I just wanted to start by saying, like I compliment you. I think that there's some really, really great stuff here. Um, and I know I, that you've been talking to staff about this. I know that you've worked on it and it, it's evident. Um, but it, I think maybe the major things that I see here have to do with the overall proportions of what is, I think, a building that is meant to reference um, like a folk Victorian home. Um, and again, I think it is exceptional in a lot of ways, but I think some of the shapes of this building are sized in ways that I think are less traditional. And so I'm just gonna point to them a little bit if you guys are willing, everybody's willing to tolerate this. And so, you know, one thing, and I've got a tool, right? Like, you know, I use my pen here. One thing is, um, you know, this forward facing element, I think is a larger than typical telescoped versions of gables and not that it's bad but i think that in composition with the overall width of the building the traditional um relationships that i see are being drawn from um i think are more abstract than the more diminutive one and a half story buildings that are commonly found in these historic districts, which I think is what staff is communicating in their staff report. I think there are solutions to this that I can make some general suggestions to, but let me take one other step back. I think the overall square footage of your building and the, the um, amenities and you know, number of bedrooms and square footages of each of the components are possible to have on this site. So I don't think it's an overall, um, you know, it's not an issue of how much poundage you're trying to put on the property, because I think that that's okay. I think it's just some, some things about the massing that, um, you know, make it seem like it is bigger because of the shapes and the overall size. And so I'm just gonna draw a thing here. I looked at your plan. In your building plan, you, you kind of have a left and a right at the front of the house, which are two bedrooms. And then I also think you have a bathroom and then you have some unusable 
areas under half roof or in some cases picked up in dormers. And in a typical historic home, it would be really challenging to get a bathroom, a bedroom, a hallway, another bedroom, and let's just say the extra four or five feet at the other end across the width of the house. So you have a wider than I would just say normal house. Um, oftentimes you'll get a pair of bedrooms and they happen right in the middle of the house and they only happen underneath dormers, but we've kind of got the full width of all of those characteristics at the front of the house. And so when I look at this, what I see is, you know, we could pick any point. I'm going to pick this one. Um, I don't know if you could see that, but what I see is, um, the kind of vestige of what is a, um, traditional scaled historic home. Um, that is inherent in your plan. It's about that big. That's about the size, I think, of a building that you would see that's a one and a half story structure. Uh, debatably, um, it might it might actually be a little bit taller. There's some confusing things here. I, I am a little confused about the still height of this window in relationship to still heights of windows on the side. Um, but I'm just going to pause on that for a second. We can take a look at it. You can respond to it. But overall, I think that, um, let me just go forward a couple clicks if possible. Overall, I think that in your proposal, the geometries of those historic, that historic building form is here. And I just put it there. It doesn't have to be there. It could be anywhere in your building, but it, it's there. And, and then I would also say, you know, it would be more typical to see a lower and I'm not saying this is a requirement in any way I'm just trying to have a collab ultimately a collaborative talk with you <laughs> I know I'm doing the like narrating right now but like uh typically the porch roof would come down a little as well um and so I think that the large gable with a towered gable at the side is the thing that's making this a larger building than I think the guidelines and traditional dimensions of, of these folk Victorian homes would normally have. Um, I'm just going to draw one other version of this quickly and it's, it's not better necessarily, but like, um, you know, another version of it would be, um, you know, that that form is over here. But I think one, one important thing to say is um, the symmetrical window that sits up in the gable, you know, that was a very purposeful thing that happened because that was where you got the head height in order to put the full window in. And the large window underneath the center of that gable, you know, the structural forces were coming down on the ends of this build, these corners. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, the lay person may not know, but those things were happening in internal to the building. And so I think, um, and I shouldn't have erased that because there's one other thing I want to just point out. I think that um, if you were to just look at the height of this build, this uh, more historic building, and it could be there or it could be a little taller, you know, it could be here versus the height of your major gable or your forward facing gable i think that you have an element that's at the front of the house that is this piece here um that is taller than what your normal narrowed gabled form might be and then i think you've got a secondary form that sits behind it that is wide, much wider than the typical secondary form um, that is much taller. And so I think that there are, I think that there are ways to get the proposal and the square footage to work. And Jeff, I mean, I, I see that you guys are very talented, you know, this is a very thought out building, but I really think that the thing that staff is pointing to is something that resonated with me as well. And it's just about the more diminutive nature of some of the major forward facing forms. Okay. And I know I've drawn this like five times now, but I'm gonna draw it one more time. Um, that could be the center. Oh shoot. My line work is terrible. Um, that could be the center. 
or that could be the center of this form or like the center could be way over here. Or the center could be way over here of the um, I would say like the dominant um, historical reference. I'm just going to put it here for a second and it could be taller too. I think if you needed it to be um, the other thing I just wanted to say is I also believe that if the proposal took that historic form or, or if you wanted that form, I mean, you could, you could pick a different shape of it, but it feels like this is what you were going for. Um, and you took this shape in that historic building and brought it to the front of the property. It, I believe you would have much, much more flexibility behind this i'm just going to draw a gable that runs the other way I, I don't know i'm just making that up but i would think you'd have much much more flexibility to do a variety of things that are you know less to that scale back of building and so my suggestion is first of all i agree with staff about the the scale and form i think it's a beautiful building um, but I think the scale of it in the context of these design guidelines make it larger than um, what the current guidelines call for. Um, but I do feel like you, there's a path that you could pursue um, if you, and, and one way to do it would be to do what I'm saying here is take the traditional form one and a half stories of a width that's a typical one and a half width, bring it to the front and then behind it, um, make the major changes that might deviate that get you the roof forms and shape that get all of the stuff you need to fit in there volumetrically. I have a couple other things, but I feel like that's my major contribution to this. Um, and so maybe I'll pass it on to my colleagues here. And, you know, I hope that you also, you know, I'm going to make a point for you guys to be able to respond to that before the end of this, but maybe my colleagues can jump in if they have anything to say. Thank you, Ronnie. John or Chelsea? Yeah, I can jump in there unless Chelsea is. Um, I think that you're on to something, which in, in the series of images that you showed that were comparative, I, um, a, a, you were trying to, well, you were showing your relative scale, the, the frontal scale of, of your proposal to adjacent and and other projects in the in the district. And the one that kind of jumped out at me was the one that had a bungalow type roof where the gable was parallel to the street face, the major gable of the house so that a sloped roof was coming towards you and the street scale prospect of the building looked smaller or in perspective would have looked smaller um, than this particular, I guess, prospect of, the, of all of the roofs kind of coming to the major face on the, on the street side. Um, and I think that's part of Ronnie jumped on the on the story and a half issue, which does seem to be the the larger characteristic of this district. But what 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 happens in this, and of course in elevation, it's 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 nice that you show a perspective adjacent to the elevation because perspective changes things. I think that the one thing, the one thing that seems, I guess, over pronounced in perspective is the gable to the right that thrusts out in front, um, the tower gable, as, as Ronnie called it. And I think that somehow that element could be shortened and some break with the gable behind it could happen in a way that made kind of that look smaller to view. And a lot of a lot of the issue with 
with massing and proportion is a matter of perception relative to the adjacent properties. Um, but I also have to compliment the design that you're presenting because I think that it's, it is in terms of, in terms of all the other things we haven't discussed yet, such as materiality and so on is a very appropriate response. Um, I think that the, the issue of the, the present, the mass presence of the building is the biggest tripping issue right now. And I don't have an answer. Thank you, John. Uh, Chelsea? Sorry, just trying to <clears throat> eat dinner at 9.15. Um, I, I think <clears throat> there's a reason why on this board we're meant to have several architects and several non-architects because I don't see any of the issues that <laughs> um, John and Ronnie just pointed out. Like to me, I think like when I look at new houses that are built across Boulder and specifically within historic districts, like I think that this looks really good. And I think it's an, it's a, a nod to what was there in the past, but it's clearly not a old building, which is the point. We don't want it to be confused with a historic building. Um, so I, yeah, I, I like the direction that it's going. And I think it's important because I've been on several LDRCs now where a lot of like different people have different direction and then they like applicants come back and try to meet the, like address the issues that were previously, um, that they were directed to address and and so I think it's important to like clarify when we're giving feedback like what is the feedback that is just going to make this a better project and what is the feedback that is specific to meeting the guidelines because I feel like sometimes those things get a little blurred at least for me they do so I imagine for the applicant they do too um so yeah, I don't, I don't, I truly, I don't have anything to add. I, I think this is going in a good direction and any like minor changes could be addressed at LDRC. Thank you, Chelsea. And I want to start out by saying that I, I think this is a very, very attractive building. And to me, it's one of those like modern, modern um, versions of, of a stately building. And I think it's really cool. I think you live in one of the greatest neighborhoods and blocks and streets in Boulder. So I can see why you um, want to invest in something of this. In its current, um, in the current proposal, as much as I think it's an awesome design and a lot, a lot of great thought and creativity has gone into it, I think as it's currently proposed, it's just not appropriate in the West Pearl Historic District like that. And I think it's a combination of things. I do think mass and scale is, is one, one issue, but then also combining mass and scale with some of the materials proposed, you know, like this might read different to me if there was like brick on it, which you do find dotted throughout the West Pearl Historic District and throughout Boulder in general. So I, I think that I think there's definitely a wonderful home you can get on this property. I do think that I agree with staff's recommendation, and I, I don't like using the word denial because um, rather than depending on how this conversation transpires, it, it you know you might want to consider um, withdrawing depending on where we land on this. But I think the reason. I agree with staff's thing. We have other LACs in front of us where the tweaking can be done and very clear conditions can be set during one of the monthly board meetings. I don't think we're quite there with this one. And I I also think I've, I've uh, witnessed over the years sort of designing from the dais and, and dais and, and, and 
council chambers and also trying to design it here tonight um, on a Zoom call. And I think that for me, I do agree with staff's recommendation that we provide valuable and some pretty specific feedback and then maybe come back with revisions because I just don't think in this historic district as drawn tonight and with the materials that the whole of it is appropriate in this historic district. Um, Jeff, I wanted to give a shout out to the ADUs that that I I think an ADU is totally appropriate. There's there's many throughout historic districts in Boulder. It does come down to the details and how that that ADU is actually designed. So it's it's not a matter of whether there could be one there or not. It really is more in the details about that. So. I don't know, um, you know, Ronnie and, and, and Chelsea, I so hear you about there's reasons why we have community members on the board as well as architects on the board. But I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's the most efficient way um, with, with, I think what staff is identifying to make it more consistent with the guidelines, but in my mind, just more overall compatible in this historic district, um, you know how to maybe we go back to the questions you propose you you propose Marcy to frame our discussion, because I definitely think there's something wonderful that can be built here, and you can have the home that you want. I just think some it's it's just not there, in my eyes. Well, we can we can begin to give specific, I guess, comments in the sense that I think jumping back in here, looking at it, I think that if, if the bulk plane was broken between the first and second floor, especially from the uh, street side elevation, so that the second floor face set back some or visually set back some from the, the plane of the, of the porch, and the front face of the tower gable, I think that would that would accomplish some of the mass mass reduction in terms of perception of the size of the building. So that would be a, an example of a specific comment that could be taken to redesign. But then I think what the reason that the first thing I asked Marcy was what it was is, and in in the spirit of all the things that Chelsea's been talking about, about a more expedited process, what would be the most expeditious process to give useful and salient kind of input into this without cutting off their their process with a denial. And John, I'm not sure if, if a, if a den yeah, I, I think the intention would be to give feedback if we can't bring it to LDRC to then allow the applicant to withdraw so that they could take that feedback and then reapply. I, I, I think that those are the two paths. I mean, obviously Could the you... third one is a denial, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but that was kind of what I was getting at is, is that, that we advised because, because we need, we need yeah. to go beyond just cursory comments that can be ironed out as it were with a, can... with a conditional approval, we probably should recommend denial. Well, why I mean, wouldn't we denial, recommend withdrawal and have a little more extended process? Why wouldn't we be able to, um, like we've done in the past, um, approve with modifications and um, like I think some of the ones that are on the screen are ones that staff has put forward. Um like high level, like we don't need to get into the nitty gritty details, but just addressing certain elements to meet the guidelines and then 
have that come back at LDRC? Well, I mean, just something, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, well, can we get Marcy's? Yeah, Marcy. Okay, Marcy, yeah. sorry. Yeah, so um, I want to convey how um, much thought we put into the staff recommendation because we do prefer to um, uh, recommend approval knowing that conditions can be worked out at the LDRC. But looking back at the statistics for last year and then just experience in the past, most LDRC cases are reviewed in one or two LDRC meetings. And the cases that took three, four, five LDRC meetings were the ones to work out conditions of the more um, complicated landmarks board approvals. And so, Chelsea, to your point about the LDRC is a rotating uh, board members, not having clear conditions to then review, I think is going to actually be a harder and longer process than providing clear guidance tonight. And then the applicants can come back, probably likely in, um, probably not in the next meeting since the deadline's today, but in the following meeting in, in um, June, which would then hopefully be a landmark sport approval and then review of conditions in one, no more than two meetings. So, well, one so or two meetings time, in a month, like so one or two meetings, I mean, that's, it sounds, it's basically the same time. It's, it could be shorter to go to LDRC. I don't think it would be in this case. Okay. I think what, what I've heard the board talk about is some pretty significant changes to the mass and scale the then having subsequent conditions about the fenestration i would have a harder time uh, falling through on those conditions because i think there are going to be some significant uh, changes to the overall design of the building that that's an important point is is that if you do like like for instance an, a comment such as offsetting the alignment of walls uh, has significant plan implications that would have to be worked out for that to be worked. You don't just simply slip the building apart and not have to reconform everything back together. I feel like the best thing we could do now is remain focused on mass and scale give the applicant direct feedback on that specific item. I agree with the other list of items here, which I, I think are more digestible, they're easier. And I'd like to hear from Jeff and Michael before we like wrap up our conclusion. And I have some other stuff I wanna talk about. Um, but I feel like if we look back at mass and scale, talk to Jeff and Michael, um, that we might be able to give them the direction that they need um, to go through an expeditious process. But I think what Marcy is describing is probably the accurate route. Because Chelsea, I think it would be hard for us to give great clarity on mass and scale without it being prescriptive. And so I knew I drew it. I knew I know I drew a thing. But like John is saying, the implications of what I'm saying or what any of us might say about what the mass and scale should do, I think are too great for us to navigate at LDRC without the applicant coming back with like a revised proposal. So. What the, isn't there a cost associated with bringing back a new application? Uh, uh, Marcy, are you talking about an application fee? Mm -hmm. uh, it's free for landmark alteration certificates, it's uh, $1,500 if it's non-designated demo review. But LACs are free. Of course, there's the the time and design fees that would apply whether it's at the LDRC or landmarks board level. So there'd be another fee? No, there, sorry, there's no oh. fee for this okay. landmark alteration okay. Okay. review. Okay. The other thing I think we can accomplish is if we're in agreement for the demo application, we could approve that. 
tonight. It, so it is part of the proposal as a whole is demolition and new construction. So okay. I think it, it's clear um, in terms of where the board sits on that. So that's probably not a point that would be rediscussed at the next hearing, but I wouldn't um, split them off into different pieces. It's one application. Okay. That's helpful. Marcy, can you roll back just one image? And then if everybody's okay with this, I'd just like to ask some questions to Jeff and Michael. Sure, go for it. Okay, Jeff and Michael, I'm sure you've got a lot to say. So I'm going to ask a specific question, but also like feel free to comment on um, other things that we've said. So when I look at this image, the sill height of this window um, is, and, and let's just say that the head height of this window is so dramatically different than the head heights on the windows on the side, which I know you have some subordinate things over there, like windows above beds, perhaps, and bathrooms and stuff like that. Um, is the window at the front of the house, does it have a two foot sill and it, are those like three, five windows or what are they? Uh, yeah, the, so the, the window at the front of the house is, is a lower sill and lower head than the ones on the sides. And primarily that is because the side facing windows, well, they have the opportunity to be higher because we're not trying to keep the roof down as much yeah. because of that steep slope roof, we're trying to keep it down for the mass and proportions. Um, but the, also the side facing windows are all in sort of tertiary spaces. They're bathroom windows, like you said, closet windows, you know, places where privacy is more important than view. And then the front facing window there is, as you mentioned, a bedroom window. So we're able to, um, I don't know, keep the sill down yeah. in that space. Do you, do you know what the head height of that window window is there? I would guess it was that we set it at seven and the side facing ones are more like eight. Okay, so that could be a five foot tall window, the two foot sill. It likely is, yes. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I guess I'd like to talk about that in a second, but I think maybe the big thing is what do you think about what we were saying? <laughs> and, you know, in particular, I was drawing something that I was just trying to give a little bit clearer direction about one way to reduce the scale of the building, which is to like take the traditional form and bring it to the front and then to take the non-traditional forms and let them retreat. And one day, one way that John, I think was saying you could also do that is, and, and maybe I'm just mashing them together is like take the traditional form, which is a forward facing gable. And then if you needed to do something else, like turn the gable to get the rest of the stuff on the side hidden behind another form, you could. Um, but I just am curious what your thoughts are on that. And then the, just the general um, scale topic that I think, you know, we were really trying to give you feedback on. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the feedback, the, we actually did explore uh, one of the first versions of this house had a side facing gable sitting the nesting into uh, a front facing gable, very similar to the sketch that you put together or you were mm -hmm. sketching. I, the, we, we moved away from that because it wasn't the simple form that the owners are looking for in this house. Like yeah. they want the, 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 the design that's here is the design that they want for their home. Yeah. And it's as opposed to side facing gable, as opposed to you know a number of different things we could look at. So I get that that we're in a historic district. We have specific guidelines we need to work around. So I totally understand that. Um, but we're also you know obviously working with a homeowner to try to achieve um, you know their dream for their home on their property. So um, yeah, we can we can explore some other things. But I I, I do want to let you know that we have checked some or we have tried some of those other options. And um, honestly, like. This this solution with this simple form um, felt more in keeping um, with the district than complicating it with side facing gables and that kind of stuff. Right. And the, this particular view um, probably is is less um, convincing of that statement because <laughs> we have mm -hmm. all these side facing dormers. Um, mm -hmm. Which honestly, I'd rather not have that many side facing dormers. I'd rather just mm -hmm. combine them all into one. Um, but we can't do that with the bulk plane. So we have to split it up into multiple dormers and they can't be more than eight feet wide and they can't be this and they can't be that. And if we could get around some of the zoning rules, um, we might be able to simplify this house further. 
But as it is, we're, we're just trying to strike that balance between the mass and form, keeping it as low and tight as we can, stay under the bulk plane, and still have a usable upper level uh, in a simple looking house. Gotcha. Um, I just to go back to one of the things I was saying earlier. Uh, I think that if you are if you were to take a smaller form, I'm just going to draw it like it's there. I have no idea where that other line is actually supposed to be. Um, and you brought it to the forefront um, and then did something else behind it, whatever. I feel like you have more ways to abstract it after you get the primary form. That's the more historic form forward um, that you would get something that is in much greater compliance with the scale piece and massing piece of the guidelines. And the other thing I would just say is um, Jeff, I could be wrong, <laughs> But I, I also think that once you do that, you might actually be able to, um, you know, in a small, not, not significantly, but you might be able to raise the knee wall a little bit, which I know is almost contradictory because I'm like, hey, bring this building down. But I think if it gets a little narrower, you might be able to bring that up just a little bit and it might help you get this some of this head height stuff, um, which I know we didn't talk about, but what I wanted to say is one of the things that also makes it look less compliant, although it's very much secondary to what it is that I think are the primary things to work on, um, is that the dormers, as you said, you like broke them up, which is great. They still behave much larger than a typical dormer and i think it's because of how high the plate is at the dormer in relation to the the knee walls at the front and the sill and the head heights at the front so that discrepancy that i was pointing at makes it look actually like bigger and 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 i know that you know a lot of times what we would do is we would you know, go and point to the dormer regulation. And the dormer regulation actually says that the um, typical dormer's wall shouldn't align with the wall below. It typically backs up into the house. And sometimes we have leniency for that. I think there could be some leniency for that <laughs> in this proposal. Um, but I would just say, like, I, I think if those dormer scale came more into proportion with the gabled scale and you got the primary form to be the dominant form stepping forward, um, that if those two things, like one gets a little smaller, one gets a little bigger, but narrower, I think that this would be great. I mean, I know that you're capable of all of those things because I see the talent and the design here. And I know that I'm also messing up everything Michael wants, which is simplicity and he wants an office slash bedroom at the front of the house. And how are you going to deal with this? What did Ronnie just say? But I don't know what the solutions are to those things. And I recognize there's program and conversations I haven't been a part of, but I do feel like getting a simple form that is more traditional in width and scale forward will get you much further down the road to be able to make abstractions behind it, if you make a meaningful setback and p perhaps even hide it with some other shape, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I, no, I, I get that. I mean, I guess my 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 bigger concern with that is 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 if it looks too much like like we're trying to create the old house with the addition behind it instead of just one new house. Yep. And so yeah. that would be another challenge to try to overcome. If it's helpful, the the first image that has the front elevation shows all of the bulk plane and and uh height restriction requirements i saw that 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 does make it a challenge i do think that gable ends can like if you had a gable end that went uh, yeah, you know left and right on this it can protrude into it up it to eight feet for 40 for some weird yep. mathematical system so yep. there you know you know it you know it better than i do but so like you could do something um, yes you can you can do a side facing gable and and in some ways it helps um, yeah. because yeah you only measure up to the eave height and the roof can go higher and it's all kinds of like hey welcome to boulder we got another rule but yeah um, it's, it's a... but so that's, so those that's would... sort of what we're fighting with so the idea like if we make it 
narrower could you raise the knee wall? I mean, yes, you could if you brought it further away from the property line and shrunk the main floor also. So, but right now we're we're basically, I guess we're about a foot below our bulk plane limitation there for our knee wall. So there is some room to move, um, but we're right, right. So we're working it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So you're specifically saying like, you know, right there you have a foot that you might be able to bring that up at most. Yep, maybe. Yeah, and I don't know how it would play out, right? Like you'd have to do mm -hmm. a different thing because your your top of roof at the current form is almost close to the height restriction. So that would require you to do some other shape on the side. So I know there's a lot of things that play. I just thought I would try to give you that description and hopefully it's a form of feedback that you can take that I think does what I believe staff is saying. And maybe staff can actually... Um, talk about that too if they think that what I'm saying is similar to what they were thinking um, but that those are my thoughts thank you John Chelsea any additional thoughts Well, we didn't really hear from Michael or, um, um, sorry, uh, Jeff about the potential of having to submit a new application. And I was just curious what they thought about that. Well, nobody wants to submit another application. <laughs> well, I want to hear from them. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I certainly think that we could work with staff to make these changes. Um, as I put in my summary, there are obvious things that we're in agreement with. Um, mm -hmm. And we can, we can work to change the, the height of the building and, and various things. And just like the issues with the ADU, I think that ADU, I don't think the design that we submitted was in its final form as we expect it to be, but it's something close. So I understand Marcy's concern that maybe we'll go down a rabbit hole, but um, I, I think we're amenable to that you know, working. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I might add to that also that my understanding is the reason that this project started at the full board instead of starting at LDRC is because we were proposing demolition of a structure. So if if that's the case, if the full board is supportive of the demolition of the structure, then us going to LDRC now is no different than if we were starting with a vacant lot in the district, it, unless I'm misunderstanding how so this process works. I think any new construction over 340 square foot feet has to come directly to the board. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So I, I so I, I don't know what the, the more like streamlined path is, if it's if it's pulling the, the proposal and then uh, coming back in with a new one or if it's going through LDRC, I, I, I can imagine a fairly nightmare scenario of having a different LDRC every week with mm -hmm. different opinions. Yeah. Well, you're probably going to get that anyway. Um, so um, it, it's going to go, your next project will go to LDRC probably. We do try um, to keep continuity on LDRCs, at least when we're aware that we've got an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it. yeah, I, I don't think we, it's, you know, 945, I think, if if Marcy is like I trust Marcy when she says that um uh pulling the application and then submitting a new one would be the best and most streamlined approach. Um so I think if that's where the board is going, like it would just be ideal for anything that is critical that the board thinks needs that they need to see from the next application in order for it to get approved. Like I would just you know, want to make sure that folks do give that direction now. I, I agree, Chelsea. Marcy, there, where was, oh. 
I might offer this um, design guideline summary. There's one for the house. There's one for the um, uh, garage, and then there's the general one. Um, and it's in the um, design guideline summary in your packet. But I might suggest as a way to expedite kind of this um, discussion is if the board could go through and do a general yes, we agree with that, or no, we we disagree with that. Or here's another thing staff didn't identify that we think is important for the um, applicant and owner to consider in their redesign. I think in our staff analysis, these are the main points that we found, but I'd be very curious um, for your feedback of, is there general agreement? Is there any points you disagree with? And then is there anything that we didn't identify that would be important to relay for the redesign? So for me personally, your summary for the design guidelines on the house, I agree with the, the points you've raised and your recommendations. I I agree with your your summary, Marcy. Um, although I don't completely by the issue of the roof material, but I think that's more of a detail issue. I think that metal could be argued for. Marcy, could you go back to the elevation image? I am also in agreement with your summary. Um, the that last you could it just needs to be actually the slide right before that's the three D that was right before your list. I just wanted to point one thing out. And I know you guys had precedent for this. Keep going one more. The one that's at the perspective. The one thing, guys, is that like this is pretty atypical. Um, I know that you can go find, you know, stone foundations to buildings, but the stone foundation that then turns into the stone porch. I know that you showed a picture of one, and it may have turned into like a brick railing system which I think is more typical like for there to be masonry on top of masonry. And that would be the reason why you'd put the stone, but for the stone to show up under what is a historically lightweight element, I think is non-traditional. I, I don't think it's not approvable because it could be an abstraction and like, you know, you could do a thing that's a little different, but I think it is a thing that you're doing that is a choice that is deviating from the typical historic pattern of like the ways in which materials were typically in relation to one another. So I would say you might consider, um, you know, letting the foundation stonework transition to a porch that is lightweight in wood. And I think you might find that it'll be just be a little bit more delicate and look more like traditional porch. And I'm not recommending that you put masonry on this because I don't think that's a requirement at all. Um, you know, but, you know, the masonry version of a home um, would, in some cases, have stone underneath it at the porch. But a, a, the version that you're doing is kind of like a hybrid. Sorry, I know that's a little bit of a detail, but I just see that. And I know that staff was kind of talking about the porch and some aspects of materiality, but I see that Jeff and just wanted to give you that little bit of feedback. So outside of that, I think that staff's um, list is a, is a really good one. And I would agree with them. Do you want me to jump in about the garage? Sure. I, I'm still, I'm finishing reading of it. Please go ahead. Okay. Jeff, I haven't done an ADU in Boulder in all forever. So I don't know if your bulk plane, you feel super confident about that bulk plane. It just looks so short. And this is basically what I think you're saying is like, hey, if you guys want ADUs, period, like we need some room to do them. And so like, is there a bulk plane problem? Because I've seen a bunch of ADUs come through landmarks and like 
they have different shapes, but I feel like you're saying, Hey, we're at our maximum here. Like, I don't know how else to get head height in this. I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I see that as part of your design. It's like, you're doing the traditional form and then you're just basically saying, I need to get head height. So I'm going to put what looks like a flat roof in the background. Yeah. So as an accessory structure, it's got a 20 foot, I think it is height restriction. So we have to stay underneath that, um, which is what's driving that flat roof. Cause by the time you do a nine foot ceiling in your garage and you know, an eight foot ceiling plus a floor structure, you plus a roof structure, you're there at 20. Can you so get the, can you get the floor structure down a little bit? You're like way up here. Is there a way to get that down? Because no, I think the, the big thing, that's the house floor. That's the house floor. Okay. Yeah. So the garage floor okay. is at the bottom of the garage door. Okay. So you're basically, you've maximized or I don't know how to say it, minimized. Yeah. You've brought down the, the top of the floor for the ADU as low as possible so that you can maximize the head height in the living space. Yeah. I mean, there's probably ways that we could steal a foot out of the height of the garage and the garage door, and then you just can't drive it, you know, an SUV. Um, but I'm not sure we want to go there and I'm not sure that extra foot is going to make it any difference to the overall mass and character of that flat roof. Yeah. I mean, th this is super hard. Uh, Marcy, are there other sides to this that we could take a look at? You know, I, I hesitate. Oh, sorry. I hesitate to um, tread out of chapter 911 of the Boulder Revised Code, but I, I do think that there's, a 25 foot height limit if you have a gable roof versus an accessory dwelling unit that has a a different roof form is 20 feet but i don't want to say that until i found the code section but um to ronnie's point we see adus all the time in historic uh districts and um i wonder if there is this other piece of code that may benefit the design but i will look i can look at that and in the goal there jeff would be all the stuff that you want to do and that we also want to do, which is to get you the right amount of head height in those rooms and for it to not have a flat roof and for it to look more like dormers built into a gable. And then the last thing would be, you know, the balcony, you know, the, the balconies we often see and approve when they face into the rear yards of homes on the side yards, they're just visible, visible from the public realm. So, you know, the code, the guidelines talk pretty clearly about that. And then the other one that's just as like an always one is the num the garage door, single garage door versus double garage door. Um, and, you know, I know that you've heard this from staff in their um, mm -hmm. memo. And, and so I agree with that. And I'm hopeful because I think what Marcy's saying is true is that there actually is some other route that gets you a little bit more headroom so that you can start to do all of the wonderful things that you are already doing in the primary house that you know how to do. You know what I mean? That's just like, how do you make it nicer? And yeah, uh, I found it and I'll, I'll forward it to you, but it says the maximum uh, height of a detached accessory dwelling unit shall not be greater than 20 feet, um, but it can go up to 25 feet if the roof pitch is at 8, 12 or greater. So I'll send this to you. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the more space you can get within the roof truss form, the better. Like it, the, the, the less of this flat roof and flat dormer thing and the more room you can get under the pitched roof, um, you know, I think the nicer these things and the more compliant they are with the guidelines. Yeah, I mean, that would fit better with what we want to try to achieve. So. Yeah, I think I think so, too. So, Marcy and team, that's kind of my summary of this, but I could, if you pull up the um, staff's um, analysis, the last page of the summary, um, yeah, redu yeah, reduce the size of door so primary roof is gabled, um, you know, that, that more or less is what we were just saying. I think if you have that tool now, you're going to be able to really modify that. You're going to have five more feet. Yeah. Um, and then the windows and doors, I think, is similar to what we just talked about. And then there's the two garage door thing. 
And then the balcony. Yeah, again, I feel like if the balcony is not facing the sides, it could face through. I don't know what the plan. I don't know what's happening with the site really. I looked at it went in the submission, but I don't have top of head. But I think you can put balconies more successfully facing the interior uh, of the backyard if if you want it. I don't know if that creates a conflict for users, but um, that is how we see most people comply with that. So I uh, also agree that staff summary here pretty much summarizes the points that we would give you as takeaways. And I agree, Ronnie. Marcy, so, a third summary? Yes, general. Thank you. So me, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. Uh, Jeff and Michael, I, I feel like hopefully we're giving you enough information. I, I feel like you're hearing, I think that we're leaning toward, you know, what would be a denial, but we would, for I think it's better for everybody to, for you guys to withdraw so that you can, you know, get back at it and then reapply and not have to wait. And then hopefully we can get to an expeditious approval and perhaps there's more review that happens with you and staff um, now that we've kind of talked in, in greater detail about some of the principles about the scale. Yep. In Recognizing that it's almost 10 o'clock, but also knowing that taking five minutes can save five hours later when um, <laughs> when we go and um, remember this conversation. Um, could I uh, summarize what I've heard, not in totality, this is a reported um, meeting, but uh, and then have the board members correct me if I've missed anything large or uh, anything like that. So in just a few minutes. Um, so what I generally heard is that um, the board members agree with this summary of revisions on the design guidelines summary for the house around the mass and scale proportion of built mass to open space, window and door size proportion and pattern. Uh, roof material, though John pointed out that uh, metal roof may be appropriate um, for the district. And then a uh, conversation about the reducing the depth of the porch slab um, and Ronnie making the point that it's unusual to have a, a stone or masonry under a lighter element of a porch. Um, and a little more detail towards the mass and scale, it seems like there, the conversation was about having a, a, a smaller scale of a predominant gable facing uh, Pearl Street and then having the mass kind of broken up or uh, kind of uh, shaped in, in different forms to, to bring down that scale. Pause there. How does that sound so far in terms of recapping the conversation and main points about the house? Sounds accurate to me. Yeah, it sounds great, Marcy. Thank you. Wonderful. The garage. Uh, general agreement from the board about the direction of, uh, of these revisions, including reducing the size of the dormers, uh, revise the design of the windows and doors to reflect the revised penetration, two garage doors rather than one, and um, revised design to eliminate the balcony or a suggestion to move it so that it's less uh, visually prominent. And then with this um, uh, ADU, regulation about a greater height for a, a pitched roof, um, perhaps that will change and address some of the concerns about the size of the dormer and the, the overall form of it. Uh, and I don't think there's anything extra on the garage have I missed. Is it in the guidelines that you're not allowed to have a balcony from uh, um, the three buildings? The guidelines, yeah, they, they do discourage balconies and talk about the visibility of, of the balconies. 
um, like Ronnie said, usually when they have been approved, it's um, either facing towards the lot or not. So I think you could, it depends more on the visibility or integrated into the roof form versus projecting. And then the final piece, these are more um, kind of standard conditions about the details, but noting the location of any removal of mature trees and then details about um, mechanical systems, lighting and gutters. These are typically conditions to be worked out after an approval, but showing any hardscaping on the uh, site plan as well. So with that, I think that summarizes the direction I think for um, Jeff and Michael, and um, I will also echo, I look forward to working with you all in this next revision. Thank you for doing that, Marcy. So Marcy, do we need to hear from the applicant a request mm -hmm. for a withdrawal? Yes, so at, at this point, um, that you, Abby, as the chair, you usually offer the opportunity to withdraw before um, any vote were be, to be taken. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to withdraw the application. Uh, yes, we would like to withdraw. Okay, thank you. And then Marcy, the next steps you'll follow up. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't I don't know if we put a slide together. So we'll follow up um, Michael and Jeff uh, to go over um, a revised design. You're welcome to reach out to me in, in the meantime or come back once you have a, a revision um, prepared and then we will um, bring that to a future landmarks board meeting. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all your thank input. You both so much. Yeah, thank you. I know. Okay, so that matters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, recognizing it's it's 10 o'clock, um, I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly. Great news that Renee was reappointed. Um, we will have her swearing in at the next uh, Landmarks Board meeting. The annual Square Nails Award Ceremony is a really nice event held up at Chautauqua, typically the first Monday after Mother's Day, but because of the community house uh, booking, it is on Wednesday. Um, May 8th, and in this moment, I'm realizing I promised Abby I would send a list of potential projects because usually a the Landmarks Board will choose some projects to give project awards to, and I am totally unprepared to uh, have those nominations. So I will, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's fine, but if you, it, is it something you can send in the next few days or early next week? Yeah, let me let me figure out how we can do this, um, like uh, virtually, and it doesn't have to come from staff. Usually, it's just hard to remember all of the projects right. that we've reviewed. Um, so, if there's any that raise to the top of mind, the general criteria we use is that it's usually a project that we have reviewed. Um, it's usually one that has been completed rather than just reviewed and, and there's a lag time in that. Um, and there's always kind of a message in what uh, projects the Landmarks Board chooses to acknowledge. So in the past, some have been exemplary uh, energy efficiency and historic preservation projects. Other ones have been like really um, labors of love in terms of restoration. Um, others have been like careful stewardship of relatively small projects, but really um, demonstrating how committed the owners are. Um, and then others are like innovative designs in, in historic districts. So 
I will circulate um, some nominations in the next week and then figure out how to choose those. And then if you are available to attend, please do come on Wednesday, May 8th at six o'clock at the Chautauqua Community House. And, and we'll recognize the two landmarks that were designated this year. And if we think of a project, we could send it directly to you too as well. Yes, yeah, please do. Okay, please thanks. Do. Yeah. Um, and as of last year, we have started tracking them through the year with our DRC. So, we, you know, so that we don't have to like go through the whole year. Um, okay, that's coming up in May. There will be a, a, a flurry of other historic preservation events across Boulder County. So look for a brochure advertising those events. And it's also on History Colorado's website also has um, a consolidated calendar of events happening across the state. Um, a cool event that is happening next Tuesday up at Chautauqua is a panel uh, discussion uh, hosted by History Colorado, I think in partnership with um, the Colorado Chautauqua Association called What's in a Name? A State Historian's Roundtable on Controversial Monuments and Place Names. And so that's on Tuesday, April 9th at Chautauqua. Um, and seems very relevant and, and pretty interesting. And I will hope to see you there. Uh, okay, and then a reminder that the city council public hearing for the proposed historic district is uh, a week from tomorrow, Thursday, April 11th. And um, John is going to be in attendance and available to uh, answer any questions from council if they want to hear directly from the um, different boards about their deliberations. And um, Abby will be traveling. I think he'll be tuning in too, but um, everyone is welcome uh, to tune in. Note that it was originally scheduled as a study session because of the land, uh, because of council's um, retreat. And so typically public hearings start after about 45 minutes of open comment. There's no open comment on April 11th. So if you're planning to tune in, it's going to be pretty close to 6 p.m. rather than the traditional seven o'clock uh, estimated start for public hearings. And then I'm rolling through these, but um, then we can discuss. The last piece is that um, the relevancy project is still front of mind and uh, Kind of depending on the outcome of next Thursday, that will have an impact on our work plan in terms of what the next project is that we work on. So I'd like to plant a seed for a summer retreat to talk about the relevancy project and how that might influence a historic preservation plan update. Um, you don't need to throw out any dates or anything like that, but um, it is something that uh, I hope that there's interest in doing. I'd be very interested in that. Thank you. Any questions or discussion on any of these, um, any of these items? I don't see any raised hands or any anyone um, turning off their mic. So, if there's nothing else this evening, and Marcy, thanks for bringing those all up. Um, tonight. I don't see anything else. So I think the meeting's adjourned at 10.07 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Well, great discussion. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Take it, care. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night. Bye.